Half a day, welcome everyone to the Guam Congress building and the Committee on Justice is now called to order. Today's Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. The, the, five, the time is 5.11 p.m. In compliance with the open government law, public notices for this round table public hearing were published in the Guam Daily Post and on the Government of Guam public notice portal on Tuesday, November 15 and Friday, November 18. The hearings being live streamed on Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. Notices were emailed to all senators and media broadcasting outlets on the same dates. For this evening's roundtable public hearing, I will first introduce the bill. We will then receive testimony from the panel. We, we had anticipated more, but because there are less, we've tried to squeeze everybody in at once so that we can just all be together in the same room. Uh, so I think there are currently about 13 people in here and one online. Uh, we're trying to accommodate participation by order of sign up and considering the need for special accommodations. Participants are welcome to provide unlimited written testimony before November 28 that can be emailed or submitted to my office. All testimony will be included in the public report on this bill for consideration of all the senators. To facilitate a longer discussion period, individual testimony, we're asking you, we were going to limit it to five minutes, but because there's only one panel, we will, we will allow you to go a little longer, but we're asking you to try to keep it to five minutes, especially, and then, you know, we, just because there's a lot of people. This will um, be followed by discussion, questions by the senators and, and other discussion. All previous testimonies on Bill 112 remain part of the packet available to all senators and available to the public on my website, Senator Terlahi at um, senator, senatorterlahi.com. All of the testimony will be included in the committee report. A copy and summary of Substitute Bill 112-36-COR has been provided to all participating panel members for your review and reference. It's also been provided online at guamlegislature.com. I'd like to thank my colleagues for attending today's roundtable public hearing, uh, Senator Tello Taitagui, and I believe Senator Perez and Senator Brown are, are coming in as well. Um, all right, so the bill is titled Bill Number 112-36-COR as substituted by the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture, introduced by myself, Teresa Terlahi, Tello Taitagui, Joanne Brown, Tina Rose Munoz barnes Joe S. St. Augustine, V. Anthony Ada, Talina Cruz Nelson, Christopher M. Duenas, Clinton E. Rigel, Amanda L. Shelton, Jose Pito Terlahi, Sabina F. Perez. It's an act to amend Chapter 10 of Division One, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated to add a new section 42A101I20 to Chapter 42A of Division Three, Title Seven, Guam Code Annotated, to amend Section 42A101J of Chapter 42A, Division Three, Title Seven, Guam Code Annotated, relative to medical malpractice in the territory of Guam. As the primary sponsor of the bill, I will now introduce the bill. Following, um, again, thank you to everyone who's here today. Following public hearings on the as introduced Bill 112 that were held in July 2021, July 7 and July 12, the committee has substituted the bill in consideration of public testimony as well as feedback from the numerous informational hearings held in the last two terms on the current mandatory malpractice arbitration. Oversights of medical licensing boards and careful review of NCSL's analysis of malpractice laws and other jurisdictions. I would like the doctors to know, and, and you who are here today especially, that I hear I have heard your testimony and I hear you, and I know and acknowledge how special medical providers, doctors, and nurses are to our community, and that I agree with you that Guam's unique health care circumstances require extra protections of healthcare providers and protect them from frivolous claims. If I did not agree with that, I would have just attempted to simply repeal the law and let the cases go straight to court as they do for all other industries and professions. 
I've never tried to do that. I've tried to find another way that doctors would continue to be treated differently from every other profession, every other industry on Guam, protected more than any other. Because for every other profession and industry, if you do something wrong, you're taken to court directly. But we are continuing to find a way for doctors to be more protected, doctors and nurses and all health professionals, more protected than anyone else. But we cannot do that any longer when we know that instead of preventing frivolous claims, the courts are pointing out to us legislators that the law may be preventing poor people's valid claims. One of the courts stated, and I quote, it would be manifestly unfair to enforce a statutory requirement against a person financially incapable of arbitrating. Doing so would have the absurd result of prohibiting the poor from recovering on a claim they might be otherwise entitled to. It would likewise shield the healthcare industry from ever owing liability to the underprivileged. There is no evidence to indicate that the Guam legislature enacted the MMMAA with such a draconian purpose in mind. I believe we should preserve the ability to make claims for all patients, not frivolous claims, but good claims, valid claims. And that is what we are trying to do, is to find a process that is less costly than the current process, just as fair as the current process, but less costly. Guam medical providers are afforded protections throughout Guam's laws. One of these protections is the statute of limitations. In almost every other state, the statute of limits is either two years or three years or longer. That means the time that you are allowed to bring a case after an injury has occurred or after discovery of an injury. Except for Louisiana, Kentucky, Ohio, California, and Guam, where it is only one year from the time of discovery of, of a harm. And that means you have to bring your lawsuit sooner, gather your resources sooner, find a lawyer willing to do the case sooner than every other place. In Hawaii, for example, plaintiffs are allowed two years from discovery, not to exceed six years from the act. On Guam, it is one year from discovery and within three years from the act. Guam's laws also require that healthcare peer review proceedings, records, and recommendations are excluded from evidence by law. Malpractice insurance is not mandated on Guam. Confidential investigations of complaints at the Guam Board of Medical Examiners are protected. So this bill intends to continue pre-trial, pre-screening in the form of, with options of arbitration, mediation, or pre-screening by a pre-screening judge as an option. With, it, with any of these options, the goal is that outcomes are not reportable to NPDB unless a judgment is made. So these are pre-trial, pre-judgment. And we are working to ensure that the language makes this clear. So while it is clear from the legislative history of the various medical malpractice and arbitration laws on Guam, that special preference and protection was intended for the healthcare industry on Guam, I do not believe that the laws were intended to shield the healthcare industry from any liability to the poor or underprivileged and thus have attempted for two terms now to remedy this and have substituted the bill to further address concerns. The goal of the legislation remains the same as the original arbitration law, and that is to prevent frivolous court actions against healthcare providers, but to ensure a fair and competent pre-trial option on top of expensive mandatory arbitration that are options that are equally effective but less expensive for all patients and to provide swift resolution. Substitute Bill 112, I'll give a, a very quick summary of some of the changes in there. 
It amends the current medical malpractice mandatory arbitration law to keep arbitration as an option, but provide an additional government-funded pre-screening process in lieu of the expensive arbitration mandated. It requires that prior to the filing of a medical malpractice pre-screening claim, a, a claimant or a patient shall provide no less than a 45-day notification to a health care provider of his or her intent to file a complaint. And during this period, the statute of limitations shall be told, meaning that holds in abeyance that time limit that you have to file a claim, and that is intended to in promote settlement discussion and, and early discussion. The substitute bill further authorizes that prior to a pre-screening, a healthcare provider may make an offer of reparations in full confidentiality. All communications regarding reparations in writing to a patient by a healthcare provider will be privileged, may not be used by any party to establish liability or measure of damages attributable to the offerer. This reinforces current rights of healthcare providers to expressions of sympathy or benevolence relating to any pain or suffering or death of a patient involved in the incident to the patient or the family of the patient. They will remain inadmissible as evidence of liability in any civil or any arbitration proceeding or any pre-screening proceeding. These provisions were added in consideration of testimony provided by, I think, Dr. Berg and other doctors uh, so that patients and healthcare providers would be willing to meet and resolve at the lowest level possible before trial. After the 45-day notice notification period, if a claim is not resolved between the parties, a pre-screening complaint may be filed. The court shall seal the case immediately from public access and refer the matter to a judge, a pre screening judge for pre-screening. Parties can agree, while this matter is sealed, to go to arbitration on their own terms or to go to mediation. Arbitration will be conducted as agreed to by the parties. Doctors can entice patients into arbitration with the three-member panel or the panel of one, any type of panel that they agree upon, by convincing them of the swiftness or the expertise of the arbitration panel, or by paying the arbitration costs, as has been done in some of the recent cases. It's totally up to the parties and can be and cheaper than the current process or can be exactly the same as the current process. If neither arbitration or mediation is agreed upon, the pre-screening will be conducted by a pre-screening judge as decided by the courts, not only a magistrate judge, judge as originally proposed. This was changed again based on testimony due to concerns raised regarding the qualification of a magistrate judge to make a pre-screening determination. We are allowed in our justice system that judges uh, are making these types of determinations every single day. And so our juries as lay people are also making these types of determinations every single day. Um, and so we are putting these decisions in the hands of judges and lay people daily. And so I hope that a pre-screening judge will be deemed by the medical community as qualified to make such a pre-screening determination. As to the cost, the pre-screening filing fee will be determined by the courts. It's going to be paid by the claimant. It will be thousands of dollars cheaper than the cost of arbitration filing fees and arbitration arbitrator's fees. And this will not require any of the medical professionals to put in additional money into any pot to cover any other doctor's claims. This is, this is something I believe the current system can accommodate as is. The judiciary of Guam shall submit an annual report on the number of claims and number that went to either option and uh, other information. Those reportings will be required. 
The courts would enact rules and procedures implementing the pre-screening provisions of the act. The current standard of care under Guam law remains intact under this bill. That means, in other words, that malpractice, what is malpractice today under current law, well, what is not malpractice today under current law will not be malpractice tomorrow if this bill is passed because we are using the exact same standard of care as is in the current law. And this was intended to protect doctors um, and and we agree to maintain that. The current statute of limitations under Guam law will remain intact. This is another protection again for the doctors. Except for the tolling of the 45 days uh, in order to encourage settlement. Any claim against any defendant within the small claim statutory limit will be exempt from pretrial screening and shall be required to be filed with small claims. So currently the small claims amount is $10,000. So claims for $10,000 or less will go to small claims. And that is to prevent any of the costs of a pre-screening judge or the cost of a arbitration or, or anything. And we're just requiring that claims in those amounts go to small claims. So the pre-screening, um, if a pre-screening claim is filed, uh, it will be served on the defendant, which are the providers. They will have 20 days to file an answer. This is similar to the current arbitration process deadlines. The judge, the pre-screening judge will examine the same testimony previously provided to mandatory arbitrators. If the pre-screening judge finds that the evidence supports the conclusion that the defendants failed to comply with the appropriate standard of care and that the conduct complained of was a factor in causing damages to claimants, the judge will proceed to set a monetary settlement value on the claim, distinguishing between economic and non-economic damages. The record of pre-screening proceedings, if it goes to pre-screening, and the pre-screening decision reached by the pre-screening judge shall remain sealed for 30 days. However, the pre-screening judge may order the pre-screening de decision sealed longer or permanently upon agreement by the parties and shall be sealed permanently if a trial is not pursued. Either party may pursue their right to a jury or non-jury trial within 30 days after the pre-screening judge renders its decision by notifying the court of the party's intent to proceed to trial. If a claim proceeds to trial, the pre-screening judge's decision shall be admissible as evidence, but the decision shall not be conclusive and can be refuted by a defendant given admissible conflicting evidence. The 40% standard or incentive for cases that move on to civil trial will remain intact. This was put into place previously under the mandatory arbitration law to discourage appeals from arbitration. This will remain in place to discourage appeals from pre-screening as well. This means that if a party appeals pre-screening decision and goes to trial and fails to improve upon the pre-screening award by 40% or more, the prevailing party will be entitled to the cost of trial and all other remedies as provided by law. The committee is also considering a, a couple amendments that are not yet in the substitute bill. One is to the standard of care. So the current standard of care reads 10106, the prevailing standard of duty, practice, or care by a reasonable physician in the same field, practicing medicine in the community at the time of the alleged malpractice shall be the standard applied. I'm going to add, or I'm proposing to add, in the pre-screening, the arbitration, and the trial, provided that it shall be an affirmative defense that can be disputed for a physician who in good faith with the informed consent in writing of the patient provided care in another specialty because of the unavailability of a practitioner on island who offers said specialty when the failure to provide said care would have adverse consequences for the patient. 
This again was based on testimony provided by many of the physicians. To further discourage frivolous litigation, I'm proposing to add the following language. After the verdict is received and filed, or the court's decision rendered in a trial de novo, the trial court shall issue findings of fact and conclusions of law announcing whether plaintiff filed a frivolous suit and if so, impose sanctions as appropriate against plaintiff in accordance with the standards set forth in Guam Rules of Civil Procedure in addition to any sanctions imposed on counsel. This is already provided in Guam law that if it's frivolous, um, the courts can penalize attorneys, but this is going to repeat this again in this um, chapter of the code and, and reiterate it. So that concludes my introduction of the substitute bill. I wanna thank again all of you uh, that are here today most of you, many of you have participated in past hearings to provide your feedback and perspective on this issue. And we have considered all of the input and will continue to do so. I wanna note for the record that I've also introduced and held hearings on other bills to address the wide range of concerns raised during these hearings on Bill 112, during oversight hearings regarding the handling of complaints at the licensing board level and public access to information on medical providers and um, try to, um, we've amended provisions in those laws. We've also uh, provided additional appropriations to the Health Professional Licensing Office for, for this swift action on complaints. There are still a couple bills pending as well. The legislature also appropriated $5 million in the fiscal year 2023 budget to the Guam Memorial Hospital, specifically for the recruitment and hiring of specialists. So um, we will now begin uh, testimony on the bill and um, I'll go from the list. Dr. Dustin Prince. Half a day, Half a day. Buenas. Honorable Madam Chair, Speaker Talahi, and all our honorable senators, I thank you for this humbling opportunity to communicate with you. By way of introduction, my name is Dr. Dustin Prince, and I'm currently serving as a practicing physician for the past 67 years on Guam and heavily involved with the physician leadership at Guam Memorial Hospital Authority and our beautiful island. In this capacity that this letter will serve, I come as a servant physician leader serving our island community. I am opposed to the changes to Bill 112-36. I am not naive that we as physicians can do and must be better at closing the communication gaps with our patients, po policing ourselves, guiding more accountability within our various fields of specialty, I definitely subscribe to the fact that there needs to be improvements within the medical community that we continually to hold as colleagues accountable. This is done to a large extent within the peer review process at the hospitals and even held within the respective medical boards. I'm aware of the fact that these processes can be improved and need to continue to have active improvement. But I'm opposed to putting extra legislative and judicial oversight as repealing the current content of the existing Medical Malpractice Arbitration Act on Guam in any shape or form that has been presented in Bill 112-36. I urge instead to not impede the process of recruiting sorely needed physician spe specialists, frankly, all healthcare providers on our island. I instead would look forward to lending my time, as I am sure most other healthcare providers on the island would, to a robust stakeholder meeting to serve our patients better by not only seeing our medical community be more accountable to one another and being more aware of our patients' needs. To repeal or make changes to the existing Medical Malpractice Arbitration Act without consulting all the stakeholders may be dangerous. There is increasing fear within the medical community that the net effect of changing 
the currently existing Medical Malpractice Arbitration Act could, and from all my interactions, would have forlorn impacts on our island, especially with our medical surgical specialties within GMH, GRMC, even public health, which it so dearly needs. I know that there are healthcare issues to improve at all levels of healthcare, starting with communication from physicians, healthcare providers to our patients and vice versa, but also from government leadership bodies such as yourselves with us as physicians, healthcare providers. I humbly and gently implore you all to think about having input and buy-in from all facets, stakeholders of your constituents that you serve as elected officials. There needs to be input from the government side, which includes the legislative and the executive branches. There needs to be input from the patient side, for sure. There needs to be input from the business side, including our third party payers, the insurance companies on their island. There needs to be input from the medical side, which includes not only the private physician, including our large and small clinics, but also government employed physicians serving at GMH and or GRMC, nurses and allied health, health providers. Lastly, there needs to be input from the law community and the judiciary on the island as all of us as key stakeholders. I know that this list is, is exhaustive, but with something so vulnerable on a grand personal scale as healthcare is and patients' lives, for which we are all patients, we need to ensure we get this right. This will take sacrifices to care for all of us on this incredible island. There will be humbling and soul searching times in this journey but as long as we stay focused on bettering the island, this can be done together. That's the word together. This is what I strive for as a, as a servant physician leader on this incredible island of Guam that we call home. I look forward to any questions you may have if I have not been clear or if you seek further clarification. I do appreciate the time that you have given me to give input while I'm reading this letter, but I also humbly appreciate the willingness to hear from all the public who are either presenting or giving written testimonies. My prayers are definitely with this island and with yours and your other colleagues who serve on the 36th Guam legislature. I pray and understand that I am not perfect, but I do strive to make sure that I check my motives and make sure that my choices are based on the betterment of whom I serve and to know that we are stronger together than we are alone. I know this is what you all strive for as well. Thank you for serving this grand island we call home, and we look forward to a bright futures ahead together. Thank you humbly for this opportunity, Honorable Madam Chair Speaker Chalahi, and to each of you honorable senators for allowing me to give my testimonies. I end by blessings to you and your leadership, and happy Thanksgiving to each of you and your families. Thank you very much, Dr. Prince. Dr. Maria Cella Mariano. Half a day, Speaker Chair Lahi and Honorable Senators. I am Maria Mariano, a family physician with a small, solo, private practice clinic in Dededo. I have been living and working as a doctor in Guam since 2008. I have been continuously board certified in family medicine for 17 years. I am also a certified medical coder, biller, and physician practice manager. I have clean medical licenses and work histories. I'd like to think that I and my work significantly help our island. I am terrified of Bill 112, and I strongly oppose it because I believe that it is not the solution for the problem it is trying to solve, and it will do immense harm to Guam's healthcare system my patients, and our entire community. Our healthcare system is very fragile. Guam has significant shortages in various types of healthcare providers and services, unlike the mainland US, where I used to live and work. We primary care physicians, like other medical providers on Guam, try to stretch ourselves within the boundaries of our specialty, training, and experience to make the best of what we have available on island, individually and as colleagues, as safely as we can for our patients. I believe that the current Medical Arbitration Act was instrumental in improving healthcare options on Guam, since it helped create an environment where healthcare can thrive and made doctors like me 
want to work and serve in Guam despite the limitations and challenges here. If Bill 112 becomes law, then we doctors will constantly worry about getting sued over a false claim. The healthcare environment in Guam will become very difficult to work with, and many medical providers will not want to work here. Bill 112 will create a wall of fear and distrust between doctors and patients because it creates a premise that we may mean to harm instead of help each other. Instead of passing Bill 112, I think the focus should be on making proper and fair arbitration more available and affordable for cases with merit, improving the gaps in our healthcare system, such as better supporting our healthcare boards so that they can properly evaluate any complaints against providers, recruiting more medical providers on island, improving our medical infrastructure, and overall, further raising our standard of care. I believe that victims of true malpractice should get justice, but Bill 112 is not the solution. Justice should be for everyone, including all the rest of us. Justice should not harm what is good to try to fix what is bad. I have a duty to serve my patients, but part of that duty is to take care of myself, to control the risks that I take, so that I can continue to take care of them. Bill 112 will make stretching myself to try to help my patients so risky that I cannot continue doing it. Because if I get sued, my patients may lose me and my care entirely. I have, a, I have been a physician for 22 years. I love my work, my staff, my patients, and our community. I was planning to practice medicine in Guam until I retire. Bill 112, if passed, will dramatically change that plan. It will make practicing medicine in Guam like seeing COVID-19 patients without a mask on, unbelievably and unnecessarily risky. It will be like committing professional suicide. I studied so many years and worked so hard for my medical degree and clean work record that working that way would be unbearable for me. If Bill 112 is passed, I am seriously considering either leaving Guam to practice medicine elsewhere, or if I stay in Guam, just giving up practicing medicine and shifting careers. I want to keep trying to be the best doctor that I can be to my patients and continue to serve our community so that I, like all other healthcare providers on Guam, can do so longer, safer, and better. Please do not pass Bill 112. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Dr. Marion. Dr. Michael Robinson. Afidi, Madam Speaker, and Honorable Senators. I'm Dr. Michael Robinson, family physician, uh, serving the island of Guam since 1998. I give this testimony as a private citizen, and my comments are, uh, <clears throat> are on my own and not any other entity. So just Masi for this opportunity to give my testimony in opposition to Bill 112-36. I would like to thank the Speaker and the Honorable Senators for this honorable for this opportunity to dialogue honestly about the best way to provide high quality health care to the people of our island. As many of us know, the cost of health care has gone up this year for many of our patients. Patients are telling me that they don't want to come in because they cannot afford the new premiums. This, my opinion is this bill will only make that worse. Patients are talking about the debt that they're incurring. In my opinion, this bill will only make that worse. I would like you to think back to when I came to Guam in 1998. Back then, there was no birthing center on Guam. Sagua was not there. The Guam Medical Plaza was not there. Guam Surgery Center was not there. Guam Cancer Center was not there. Guam Radiology Consultants were not there. MDX was not there. GRMC was not there. American Medical was not there. 
Dr. Cunha's wound care clinic was not there. Dr. Shea's clinic was not there. Dr. Yang's dental clinic was not there. Dr. Castro's ENT clinic was not there. There was no hemodialysis centers on Guam, only at GMH. There was no sleep clinic on Guam. Dr. Lombard's clinics were not there. Dr. Dita Benedictus' clinic was not there. Many other healthcare practice practitioners were not there. I remember in the newspaper, the doctors were advising patients to go off island for surgeries. It has changed. Doctors now are inviting patients to stay here to do surgery. We have a good team. The governor of Guam, the legislature, the dedicated healthcare professionals, the people of Guam have worked well together. We have come a long way. Let's keep working together to do the best for our patients on Guam. The future of our island is in our children. You know, when I think back to what has happened since our last uh, testimony here, we've lost multiple OBGYNs. We've lost neonatologists. We've lost pediatricians. Yesterday, I came back from Florida recruiting physicians at, in Florida. Under the best of circumstances, it's tough to get physicians here. In my opinion, it, this bill will only make it worse. My voice is for the children of Guam. Please don't pass this bill. Let's do everything we can to make our island better for the children who come after us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Dr. Jonathan Thorpe. Half a day, Madam Speaker and legislative members, thank you for the opportunity to join today. I am Dr. Jonathan Thorpe, internal medicine physician, a private citizen, and I'm here to also voice my strong opposition to Bill 11236 as substituted. From my perspective, the bill as substituted is legislation that, if enacted, will harm the community to a degree that is unmeasurable and unfathomable at this juncture. Please allow me to share a little bit of my background, and I shared a little bit of this last time, so I may be repeating myself, but I grew up on a farm in Western Canada, and it's that farming connection that connects me with so many of my patients I see on a daily basis in my clinic at the Guam Seventh-day Adventist Clinic. My father is a clergyman, and it was through his work that I discovered my calling and passion in life to be a healer. And to that end, I pursued education at the most prominent and prestigious medical institutions in the country. And I'm grateful and thankful for the opportunity that this culminated in my internal medicine training at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. It was in that uh, institution where I had the privilege of working in an inner city clinic, caring for some of the poorest and underserved in the entire city. And at the end of my training time, I had the opportunity to stay in academics and or private practice, but I opted to create for myself a different career path. A path focused on improving medical care for the poorest of the poor in some of the least developed regions of the world. And to that end, I had the privilege of working in Nepal for four years. And during that time, I worked tirelessly to improve systems of care and quality of care for a vulnerable population. When my time in Nepal came to an end, a good friend of mine informed me that Guam had a dire need for medical professionals. And with a little research, I discovered that the federal government had designated Guam as a health with as a health professional shortage area for all specialties. And now that I've worked here for two years, I can attest to this reality of the dire shortages patients face when trying to access health care, despite the incredible advances that have been made in the last 20 years. And Madam Speaker, your bill, I posit, will bring unmeasurable and unfathomable harm to the people of Guam. That is not just a broad description. Those are for real people, children, parents, uncles, aunts, brothers, sisters of many sitting in this room. Madam Speaker, the expense and time that it will take for a judge to understand the nuances of care to determine if the standard of care was breached or not, I don't believe has been calculated into this proposed bill. Our judges are well educated, but to make a fair and impartial decision, which they are required to make, I think we would all agree, will take immense effort on their behalf to understand the nuances of medicine, surgery, and or any other healing art that may come before them. To this specific point, I refer you back to comments that were made at the last hearing in July of last year. 
uh, written by a justice saying that the justice system was not prepared for the incredible burden that this would place on the court system and the judges themselves. In the letters, um, I want to also re refer the listeners to this healing to a specific section of bill, proposed bill section 10107, section F, and I quote, if the judge finds the evidence supports the conclusion that the defendants failed to comply with the appropriate standard of care and the conduct complained of was a factor in causing damages, damages to claimants. Again, I have no doubt that our judges are well trained and will make an impartial decision. But to arrive at that decision will take, I believe, uncalculated effort and expense that has not been considered in this process. By striking down the three-person MMMAA panel, which is made up of physicians agreed upon by two parties and a lawyer, replacing with a single judge, the cost of litigation goes through the roof. Tens of thousands of dollars will need to be found to bring expert witnesses to the stand for both the claimant and defendant, including during the pretrial phase. Countless hours will be pulled away from patient care, and all this is triggered by any person who sends a letter to a provider saying that they're going to litigate and then give 45 days uh, to, until the uh, filing of the, of the case. Bill 11236 opens the door wide for meritless and toothless cases to be filed against any practitioner in the community from my perspective. It is this reality that has resulted in the insurance underwriters stating that they will pull out of the Guam market. No medical malpractice policies will be available for our providers. Few doctors will work without malpractice. If this bill passes, there is no question we will lose clinicians. So, Madam Speaker, I ask the question, how do you plan to staff the clinics and hospitals of Guam when the exodus occurs? What provider in his or her sane mind will practice without access to medical malpractice insurance when the legislator just made it very easy to file a suit? I share this point because I'm a temporary physician in Guam. I'm, living, I'm willing to live thousands of miles away from family and to take a huge cut in pay to serve a population who does need access to care. I think of the 50-something-year-old gentleman, um, an army vet, vet in my clinic with terrible psoriatic arthritis who could not access rheumatological care for three decades of his life. It was through my connections with academic faculty stateside who were willing to come to Guam, be licensed in Guam, and then develop a treatment plan for this army vet. His psoriasis, as of this last month, is finally treated, and for the first time in decades, he's no longer living in crippling pain. You may ask, well, if Bill 11236 is passed, when will Dr. Thorpe leave? I believe that question is hubris. Whether or not I leave on the first or maybe even the second flight after the bill is enacted is not relevant, as I'm not planning to be here for the rest of my professional life. What is relevant is the toxic environment you will create that will make it next to impossible to recruit Guamanian or non-Guamanian um, providers, healthcare professionals, to Guam to serve this island for decades to come. MMMAA created an environment which resulted in a massive growth in the surgical and medical specialties. New clinics, new facilities, new services were all made possible through this act. I would propose, I would ar urge, I would request to fix the underlying problem with MMMAA. Provide a fund for the indigenous to access the MMMA process when a lawyer will not take the case on contingency. Fund the boards to ensure they can follow up on complaints. Fix the root problem, please. The only winner, in my opinion, in 11236, if passed, is the personal injury lawyers, and the primary loser is patients. I thank you each for the time, for the opportunity to speak today, and I also wish you and everyone else a wonderful Thanksgiving this next, this next few days. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. Dr. Mariana cook -Hyun. Thank you. I believe I will go over five minutes, but not by much, so please excuse me. Hafadeh, Madam Speaker, and members of the 36th Guam Legislature, I was hoping to see more of them here today. Unfortunately, we have you three, but thank you for your time. My name is Mariana cook -Hyun, and I am a native to Guam, born and raised um, on the island, born at GMH. I am a family medicine obstetrician, and I returned to Guam knowing that our healthcare system was going to be under-resourced and limited in professionals. What I did not expect was to be so unsupported by our legislature who proposes bills that hinders my ability to offer quality healthcare. 
the bottom line is Bill 1112 will be disastrous to an already fragile healthcare system and access to care will be further restricted. This bill will set us back and limit our advances in healthcare. I strongly oppose this bill and the revised um, proposed bill. Bill 1112 was written with good intention to help improve access to the justice system. I agree that there needs to be work done there, um, in, but Bill 1112 is not the solution. The Mandatory Medical Arbitration Act needs to be protected while finding ways to decrease costs or increase funding. The problem is the affordability, not the process itself. The authors of this bill seem to feel that the judiciary system is the only way to hold physicians accountable. The irony of this all is that the patients in our community for whom this bill is intended to help will be the most negatively impacted by its passing. Access to care will be extremely limited and non-existent in some cases. Fighting this bill again cannot come at a worse time for our island's healthcare system. I'm an emotional person, so I was hoping not to cry, but I might. Um, especially for women's health. I am here representing the women's health providers on island. Since our last meeting, hearing on this bill, we are now experiencing a critical shortage of OB professionals. I know Dr. Shea is gonna go in detail about this as well. We are also limited in specialists. Dr. Greg Harada, who is our only maternal fetal medicine specialist who provides any care on island, as well as Dr. Keith Tarada, who is hoping to come to Guam to offer gyne oncology services, have both submitted testimony that they will not come to serve our island's population if Bill 1112-36 were to pass. Local OBGYNs and surgeons will not assume liability in these cases, and women will have no one on island to care for them. So if you, your mother, your daughter, has a very high-risk pregnancy or a gynecologic cancer, she will have to travel off-island for care or suffer the consequences if she cannot afford to. Currently on island, we have three private clinics accepting OB patients. We are already limited in our availability to care for the highest risk patients. Add Bill 1112 to the mix and these women will have nowhere to go because the liability will be too high. As for me personally, I am the only family medicine physician on island offering obstetrical care with additional training in high risk obstetrics and cesarean deliveries. I manage high-risk patients in consultation with my OB colleagues and off-island specialists because the alternative, again, would be no prenatal care. If Bill 1112 passes, I will decrease my practice to just low-risk OB patients, meaning one less high-risk OB provider on island. We are actively recruiting OB professionals, and it is hard for them to come already. If, if the liability is higher with this bill passing, they will definitely not even consider Guam. The reality is you do not know the dangers this bill could bring if it were to further hinder, hinder access to prenatal care. You do not see what we see. You cannot imagine how many women on this island are without prenatal care currently, nor can you imagine the consequences and complications not only for the mom, but for their baby. Guam has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the nation. This will only worsen if Bill 1112 further decreases access to prenatal care. OB professionals are among the highest at risk for malpractice claims. And it is often not because there is any medical negligence or malpractice performed, but because bad outcomes can happen in the OB world. We are not a litigious community. We do not we do not have frivolous lawsuits. My fear is that medical negligence or malpractice will be seen as just a bad outcome. We need to continue to have communication with our patients and help them understand the difference between those things. When something bad happens though, people want someone to blame and Bill 1112 will make it easy to try to blame the medical team. The end result of increasing obstetrical malpractice rates affects low-income women the most. OB providers will cease to offer care. Subsidized OB care will be reduced, and OBs will refuse high-risk cases and uninsured, 
un and underfinanced patients. We also have to think about the impact this will have on Guam's legal system. I don't think anyone here is representing them, but it has been stated about what Dr. Uh, sorry, Judge Carbolito mentioned in the first round of hearings, that this bill puts the ultimate decision in the hands of a judge who has no medical background or knowledge. Significant time and resources will have to go into each case because the judge's decision could leave Guam with one less healthcare professional to practice. An NIH publication called The Medical Malpractice Crisis and Poor Women noted that attorneys are not always willing to accept malpractice cases for low-income patients, and private lawyers are more likely to reject claims from poor women, mostly due to the lower economic losses claim resulting in a smaller reward and a lower attorney payout. Bill 1112 does not address any access to funding for those most at need, which was the original problem proposed. One of our biggest obstacles on Guam is retention of our current professionals and recruitment of new ones. This is not just physicians. This is mid-level providers, nurses, technicians, therapists, pharmacists, veterinarians, and dentists. Without liability protection, it will be even harder to attract new healthcare professionals to our island. I am disheartened that the authors of this bill think these changes will actually improve the quality of healthcare for our people. No politician or non-medical member of the community can fully understand the consequences of passing this bill as stated above. We need lawmakers to hear our ideas and work with, with us on how to make things better. We need to maintain healthy patient-provider relationships and we need our community to trust that their medical team is working hard to keep them safe in a system that is in dire need of improvements and more resources. I do recognize there are many underlying issues that need to be addressed, which I urge the senators to focus their energy on. How can we make the arbitration process affordable? The medical community offered ideas for helping create an arbitration fund, including a proposed bill addressing funding sources, including an extensive flow sheet that we provided to the legislature. Ultimately, what we need from the legislature right now are ways to help recruit more healthcare professionals to the island beyond just a check. We need help through GVB, public health, everyone to get on board and try to get people to come to this beautiful island and serve this beautiful population. We need the legislature to help move forward with the building of the new hospital for our people and help expand the services of public health. What we do not need is legislation like Bill 1112 passed. We do not need legislation that allows non-medical personnel deciding the fate of our lives and our ability to practice medicine. We do not need legislation that will worsen our community's access to basic care as well as specialty care. Please vote no on Bill 1112 and consider proposing entirely different legislation to address the affordability issue while preserving the Medical Arbitration Act. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Stay safe, stay healthy. Happy Thanksgiving. Sai Namasi. Sai Namasi, Dr. Robin Marquardt. Uh, please get a microphone. Yeah. And turn it on. Good evening. I'll start with my sister's statement. My name is Robin Marquart. This is my mom. She died at GRMC. I'll uh, read my sister's statement real quick. On Wednesday, August 1, 2018, at around 10 a.m. that morning, my Mother called me from the hospital bedside phone and said that she was, will be discharged around 1 p.m. and to come and pick her up. I said to my mother over the phone, are you sure about this, mom? Let me talk to the nurse in charge. So my mother handed the phone to the nurse in charge who said, yes, she will be discharged around 1 p.m. I did not feel right about this at all. Nurse John pierre Leon. RN and Dr. Ji Yong Kang, MD, gave the approval for my mother to be discharged, even though 
Nurse JP observed my mother throwing up and gagging on her lunch. I walked out of my mom's hospital room in the hallway to call my brother, that's me, on the phone, on my cell phone to tell him about my mom and what was going on. As I was on the phone, Nurse JP asked me while I was on the phone what was wrong. I replied, I'm disgusted. Watching my mom vomit, even with his observation of my mother, Nurse JP still typed up the discharge for, forms for my mother to be discharged. I felt, I felt they just wanted her to leave so they could free up rooms for other patients without assessing my mom's current medical state, which any health professional would know she was not fit to leave the hospital. Dr. Kang did not even consult with me and talk to me in person. She told Nurse JP that there was no need to talk to me and that there was another patient that, was, that she needed to talk to, which I brought which I thought was strange because maybe she might have discharged the wrong patient. At around 2.40 p.m., my mother and I arrived at the Micronesian Mall to get something to eat on the way home. While inside the Micronesian Mall, I observed my mom sweating profusely and was climbing to the touch and, could, and cold all over her body. I immediately called 911 emergency. Okay, at 9.03 p.m., Emergency responders arrived at Micronesian Mall and met with my mother and I. Where did she come from? I said she was just discharged from the Guam Regional, Guam Regional Medical City Hospital. Medical Medic Joe took my mother's vitals and informed me that he will have to bring my mom, mother back to the GRMC Hospital. Okay. So this is my mom. Blandina Marquardt. Blandina, my mom, her name is out there. I think they still have that thing out there. Well, they, had the, they had the thing out there with all the war survivors. She did not receive her $10,000, which she used to say, uh, she said to the doctor, I think, or the paramedic one time, uh, make sure I'm okay because I want to get my war reparations. Okay, so she never got that. Anyway, she passed away. You can see um, she prayed the rosary every single day. Okay, she went to church every single day, and I took her. I have not been to church on a regular basis, certainly since she died, August 2nd, 2018. I'm, I'm tra traumatized. Uh, do I want to go to church? Do I want to just stay home? Okay, so that doesn't matter because I'm, I'm going to start going to church again when I feel better. But I want to talk about some of the things I heard today. Now, I know it's about money, okay? It's uh, pretty much all about money. I want to just say this, no more excuses. Profit, the medical industry, especially Big Pharma, is a profit monster, monopoly. On Guam, and I was raised in Hawaii, by the way, the word uh, teach, uh, doctor is actually means teacher. So teacher in Hawaii is kumu. So, you know, in Guam, in Hawaii, they're called uh, kahuna. Wait, wait. Is it Kuna? Anyways, if it doesn't come to me. But they don't charge these healers, these healers, I should say, I don't mean to say that, these healers, they don't charge. Typically what it is is they go by donations. So I see someone who's, who calls himself a uh, Suruhanu. They're not, they don't expect money, they don't charge. Sorry. They, they don't charge, but any monies they received would be just donations from the heart, they like to say. Or food stuffs, you can give food. So I think as a medical doctor, by the way, I have a bachelor's degree in business administration, and I'll get a little bit more about my education here. If we take money out of the equation, do you guys, you, you medical doctors have what you need? You got your facilities? Okay, that's important. So some things that came to mind. I'm a, I'm a wannabe governor. I should have ran against Felix. And congratulations, uh, Senator Talahi, I did vote for you, and uh, I'm a Republican. But anyway, solutions, solutions, solutions is what I like to say. Roster rotation. A number of doctors can come here knowing they'll only be here for six months or whatever, 
time frame. And so it's not so much, here's our doctors and this is all we got to work with. How about a roster where we have some of the best specialists come in? The money that a doctor would get upon a malpractice sentence would go to the victim. And I've been a real estate broker, I'm a real estate, I'm a real estate broker, realtor, general contractor. I'm currently not licensed because I haven't been able to get, uh, get my, set, my, my, my mindset together since my mom passed away. What is this? This is from Bank Pacific. We were going to build a brand new house. Mom made $6,000 a month. So she was 75 years old and she used to like to say, I'm going to live to 88. So very, very positive woman. None of that saved her. And I was doing my best to change. I, I, I had a, a yogini come to the house and do yoga with my mom. And so I was doing my best to help her live another 13 years. As she would say, she's going to live to 88. So why I brought that up is because I, I don't know how you guys make money. I don't know how that works. But anyways, I mentioned that because I know that there, a lot of people think doctors make a lot of money. I don't know if it's true or not, but a lot of people think that. So the amount of money you make, there's a malpractice, whatever you made would go there, would go to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the person, uh, the victim. Uh, maybe you have an insurance. I don't know how the insurance works either, but all that can be tied. Uh, so it... So, so we can find a solution. Um, now, why can't we, and we should, have the best services, considering the VA hospital is here? Say, now, St. Luke's, St. Jude's, I'm not sure if those are the, the schools, but there's the, the ones for cancer and the ones for children. The, now, why can't we have a, 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 that kind of level of medical pr uh, service providers? These would fix the root problems, because I hear about root problems. I hear how this is disastrous. This is disastrous. This is disastrous when mom and I were planning on building a brand new house, $400,000. She's make $6,000 a month. I don't make that. I make barely $2,000 a month. Okay, but mom and mom deserved the best. You know, she prayed a rosary every day. All four decades. Glorious, sorrowful, joyful, and luminous. Why do I know that, right? Because I prayed it with her every day, and I, I prayed it in other languages as well. So, a couple more things. I don't see the sign up for the time yet. Okay, so, Axis is, Axis as is, is already delivering dead people. And, okay, I'll come to this other one later if I need to. But here's an idea that I thought of. So, Guam, Guam doesn't have a law school. Guam doesn't have a medical school. So, Robin Marquart. My dad, my dad, uh, 15 seconds. My, my great-grandfather's uh, Augustus, they used to call him Doc. So Marquardt Island lawyer and holistic experimental standard and progressive medical medicine, medicinal medical, medical schools. And finally, I'll just say this last thing, because I, I heard about the uh, OBN, and I'm not too sure about how that stuff works. But abortion should be treated as, a, a, abortion should be treated as manslaughter in drunk driving cases. That's the end of my, I have my time's up. Thank you very much, Mr. Marquardt. Rose Greeno. Good evening, Madam Speaker, Terlahi, Senator, Taitagi, Senator Perez. My name is Rose Greeno. I'm a registered nurse. I've been practicing in Guam for over 25 years. And I'm here to talk about uh, and representing the healthcare as a healthcare administrator of FHP Health Center. We oppose Bill 112 36. Because if it enacted into law, clinics and healthcare providers will face an avalanche of frivolous lawsuits that will discourage licensed healthcare workers from moving to Guam to care for the local population and our existing providers will limit practice, or even worse, will choose to leave Guam. This bill is detrimental to our already vulnerable healthcare system. We work with you, um, Speaker Terlahi, and so we reviewed the, um, and found the following issues. There are seven issues that I presented on my written testimony, but due to the time, I'm not going to be able to go through that one by one. But I want to make sure that 
you review in the seven issues with recommendations from our team before this um, law advance into legislative process. But I want to take my time to read the testimony of Dr. Vidi Duenas. So I'm going to use my time to read. Half a day Speaker Terlahi and Senators of the 36th Guam Legislature. My name is Dr. Vinnie Duenas, an internal medicine physician practicing at FHP Health Center and medical director for Taking Insurance Company Incorporation. Although I realized the intention of Bill 112 and sympathize with those who had been wrongfully harmed by medical negligence, mandatory arbitration remains the most fair, expedient, and cost-effective process for alternative dispute resolution as evidenced by data from the American Arbitration Association in various industries across the board, te across the board tested and proven. The passage of this bill, despite few it might end up helping, will undoubtedly have a detrimental net effect for the entire island with immediate impacts. Since 2013, I have been serving the people of Guam in various roles from hospital medicine to outpatient primary care. The unique environment in which we practice forces me to take calculated risks every day. Why? Because oftentimes there's no one else to rely on. We are obligated as physicians to help, to treat, to heal despite what the conditions are, ideal or not. Working in such underserved and disadvantaged area poses multiple challenges that many people aren't aware of. To put things into perspective, Guam have roughly 179 physicians per 100,000 people compared to 290 physicians per 100,000 in the U.S., over 100 physicians short. Yet, we're still expected to do the same job with same quality in a timely manner which is near impossible. On top of this, we treat one of the sickest population I have ever seen. We do our best we can with what we have in all with good intention. In fact, I think many of us go above and beyond considering the circumstances and the resources that are available. Would a judge with little to no medical expertise or inside knowledge of the complexities of medical decision making be able to discern all this? I'm not, sure. I'm not so sure, and that's what worries me. If this bill were to pass, I simply will stop taking this risk, risk that I assume out of my passion for medicine and my calling to help those in need, the people of Guam, and the reason I came back home. On day one, I will no longer obviously see physician, physician assistants and the thousands of patients they treat each year. This will create a severe shortage in primary care access. On day one, I will no longer wear my subspecialty hats in cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, and you can name it. More of that. This would mean overburdening subspecialists with unnecessary consults. On day one, I will no longer clear patients for much needed outpatient surgeries, causing a delay in care with harmful repercussions. On day one, I will send anyone for any doubt in mind to the ER with my new defensive medical practices, ER that are already bursting at the seams. This is what the passage of this bill will create, not just for myself, but for many of my colleagues who will do the same. I can assure you, Senators, that we're playing a very dangerous game here, one where there will be many more losers than winners. And for some, they will pay the ultimate price. Our efforts should be aimed at an improving access to care, the only real solution to achieving good patient outcome. Very respectfully, Vincent Vini Duenas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greeno and, and uh, 
Dr. Duenas. Dr. Marilee Dulé. Okay. Um, Dr. Alexandra Leon Guerrero. Good evening, Madam Speaker and um, other members of the legislature. Um, Sidzu Usmaasi for allowing me to speak here today and provide testimony. Um, my name is Dr. Alexandra Leon Guerrero. I'm a mother, a Chamorro, a physician, and myself, a patient. I'm writing, or I'm here to express how I am strongly opposed to Bill 112-36. The healthcare infrastructure we have on Guam is fragile, as so many others have already said. We are constantly in need of medical supplies, of generalist and specialist physicians, of nurses, of technicians, of better facilities. The list of things that we are lacking is just never ending. And I'm talking about the basics here, not luxuries. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't hear the words, oh, I'm sorry, doc, we don't have that supply available. Or we don't have that specialist here on island. Or that medication cannot be purchased here in Guam. I've had to cancel surgeries because we don't have a supply in stock. Our medical community nevertheless survives. We even attempt to thrive while working in this constant state of crisis or near crisis. Whatever we lack, we make up for with our heart, our ingenuity, our, our resourcefulness. If this bill you are proposing passes into law, however, I feel not even that will be possible. Who will deliver babies when there are no obstetricians? Who will operate on children when there is no surgeon willing to operate on a child? That's the reality of this bill. That's the reality of healthcare on Guam were this bill to pass into law. Where now patients have limited choices, they might have no choice. Clearly, the current arbitration law has flaws in that the costs associated with pursuing a claim are too high for many in the community. Everyone here agrees on that. Then why don't the lawmakers focus on fixing the cost problem? Find ways to make arbitration or mediation more affordable. I know for a fact that many in the medical community have approached lawmakers and offered various solutions to this end. Exploring and creating ways to lower the cost of arbitration is a solution that addresses the core complaint of those against the current law while simultaneously protecting the fragile healthcare system we have on this island. Because quite honestly, keeping Arbitration is not entirely about protecting doctors, as many have suggested. Physicians will find a way to survive. Some will limit their practices, for, which for many will mean not accepting patients who are self-pay, who are Medicare, who are Medi Medicaid, medically indigent. They just won't see those patients because of the liability. Others will just not see high-risk patients or limit their practices. They won't see anyone who has a complex medical problem. Instead, they will opt to refer those patients off-island. And finally, most will just close up shop completely, retire early, or move off-island to find work elsewhere. The truth is, it is the people who stand to lose, the very sick, the poor, the uninsured, and the underinsured. Lawmakers and the people of Guam must try to see the bigger picture, that arbitration is about safeguarding our healthcare infrastructure for the greater community, for the people of Guam. The people are the ones who stand to lose should this bill become law. I urge you to abandon this bill and instead 
focus on legislation that makes arbitration more affordable. Let all the stakeholders in this community, everyone who stands to have an, uh, be impacted by, by malpractice and arbitration, and work together to improve the health and well-being of our community. Thank you, and Sidzu Usmaasi. Thank you, Dr. Langer. Dr. Jurga Martin. Good evening, Madam Speaker and the legislators. Uh, I'm Dr. Jurga Martini. I'm a general dentist at FHP. I'm the, probably one of the newer doctors on the island. I've been practicing here for a little over a year. And I strongly oppose the bill because I've been on both sides of it when I practice in the mainland. Um, I've been a member for a peer review committee arbitrating cases, and I've also been a victim of a frivolous lawsuit over 10 years ago. So uh, this bill is very important to me. Um, I'm not going to speak for a long time. Obviously, I'm not, not prepared. I appreciate you giving me a chance to speak. Um, since I started practicing in Guam, I realized that people are very sick. They're very sick dentally and their general health, and it's all related. People are on tons of medications, and uh, uh, as far as advanced periodontal disease and dental caries rate, I've seen cases like this only on my mission trips in Guatemala and Nepal, where people have no access to, to care. Here we have access. It's very hard to recruit uh, providers to the island. Everybody knows that. It took me almost three years to get here, and it's a big risk coming, coming from cushioned life to in the middle of nowhere. Um, when I started practicing, I noticed that uh, most of the general dentists don't do specialty work. And we have one oral surgeon on the island, one endodontist, and two periodontists. Uh, I'm trained in a lot of specialty work, and as a, as a general dentist, I provide that kind of work. Um, it used to be that we refer patients to an oral surgeon or, or to an endodontist, and they cannot get in, and they wait for months, and they come back, we put them on antibiotics, and then, then they come back, they cannot get in. So patients come back, two, three rounds of antibiotics, and then we pull the teeth, because they cannot get in to see a specialist. Um, so I do provide that kind of care, oral surgery, wisdom teeth, root canals, and et cetera. However, with this bill, I, I don't think it will, be, it will be feasible to continue taking care of the patients. Uh, we will probably have to go places where they need this, those kind of providers and experience. So just to be brief, I wanted to speak that we need specialists here, and this bill will really impact the health, general health and dental health of our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Dr. Shea, I think it's online. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Shea. You, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, um, Madam Speaker. Uh, my name is Dr. Shea, Thomas Shea. I'm a board certified OBGYN. I have been practicing in Guam for over 26 years now. That's a long time for a doctor who's not from Guam to stay in Guam for a quarter of a century. I can speak on behalf of all the OBGYNs on Guam as I'm the chair of the Department of OBGYN at Guam Memorial Hospital. And as the Guam Medical Association president, we want to make it very clear that we are all opposed to your amended bill 112-36. You have good intentions, but this is not the way to go about it in improving health care for the island people. Senators, I don't know if you realize this, but previous testimony, and now over the last two years, we have lost four fully trained OBGYNs. Over five years, we had lost a total of seven OBGYNs. That's seven fully trained OBGYNs left Guam. Now, as the chair of OBGYN at Guam Memorial, I spoke to every one of them, and Bill 112 was one of their concerns. And it was their major concern when I talked to them about coming back to Guam. 
Bill one one two is scaring physicians away, qualified physicians. If you want to go after bad doctors, Bill one one two is not going to do it. It's going to go after good doctors. Come January, so that everybody know we're losing one more OB/GYN on Guam. This is a fact. My pregnant moms currently have a difficult time getting an appointment with an OB/GYN. That's a fact. If you pass Bill one one two, you will be impossible. To get an appointment, and there won't be any OBGYNs left in Guam to deliver future generations. Bill One One Two is a very dangerous legislation. Now, as previously discussed, the current arbitration law has been upheld constitutionally by the Supreme Court. So, if there is a true medical liability case, the patient can still move forward with the lawsuit. The mandatory arbitration law is there to ensure that the case has merit. Now, think about this. If there is true merit in a liability case, the attorney for the client would take the case and move it forward. My dad's an attorney, my uncle's an attorney, and we discussed this very detail of liability in detail. It is when there is a questionable merit or meritless case that is when the attorney rather just simply file and harass, use that instrument to harass the medical provider, and this is what the amended bill one one two would be encouraging. There is no improvement of healthcare. At all with Bill One One Two, the concern one pointed out is the affordability. And Madam Speaker, I think you uh, quoted a judge that says it is the affordability aspect of it. The bill remains intact; it was not held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. But we all agree that litigation is much more expensive than the mandatory arbitration. But be it as it may, we have provided the legislature with an alternative solution to help fund. But we must leave the original mandatory arbitration law intact. The people of Guam today are fortunate because of the current arbitration law that has dramatically improved access to healthcare, because it has worked to screen out frivolous claims. Remember, Guam used to have only two, two major clinics and one hospital, and a handful of healthcare providers prior to the current mandatory arbitration law. And I vividly remember Dr. Christopher Perez and Dr. Stadler both passed away. But since 1996, after my arrival with the United States Navy, they convinced me to establish practice outside and help them out at Guam Memorial Hospital. And the first baby I delivered 26 years ago was at Guam Memorial Hospital, not the Navy. Since then, 1996, since the passage in the 90s of this mandatory arbitration law, I witnessed the growth since the current mandatory arbitration law has passed. Look at the growth. This is just to name a few. Guam Surgery Center, GRMC, American Medical Center, Mahabadala Centers, Pacific Cardiology, SAGWA, IHP, Evergreen, Guam Urology, Lumbar Health, multiple dental clinics, half a day specialists, pediatric clinics, Island Cancer Center, Guam ENT, Island Health, Island Eye, Island Surgery Center, Guam Radiology Consultant, SOAR, Nugent PT, Express Care Pacific Medical Group, Health Services of the Pacific, Guam Dermatology Institute. Yes, we do have a dermatologist now in Guam. Mariana's Foot Care Clinic. And most recently, the Shea Clinic Associates, we built a brand new state-of-the-art clinic for women and children right here in Tomini. I may not be on Guam for long, and the critical shortage of OB-GYN's got to be taken seriously. Bill 112 is just bad, bad for women and children. We have a rotating maternal fetal medicine specialist that comes to our clinic. And that's Dr. Gray Hirata. And I have to convince him to come here. He had already written testimony that he will stop coming to Guam if Bill 112 is passed. In 2023, we're adding our first GYN oncologist for women cancer treatments on Guam. And that is historic for this island. But Bill 112 is gonna set us back. We're not gonna get this gyne gyne oncologist coming to Guam. That's the saddest part. Now, these are the result of the current mandatory arbitration law that have helped our island improve to what it is today. But all the clinics and all the new physicians who's coming here, and they're not bad physicians. They're competent, university-trained, board-certified physicians. Please also remember, all of these clinics, the doctors you're talking about, also stayed open during the pandemic to care for the people of Guam. Imagine, just imagine, many of these clinics that I've talked about was not developed, was not in existence in Guam. What would happen to the people in the pandemic? 
thousands and thousands of people would have died. The current arbitration law has set up Guam's healthcare infrastructure, not just creating thousands of jobs, but it increased our life-saving skill workforce and have helped this island save thousands of lives. So senators, please realize because of the current arbitration act, more investments in healthcare has taken place on Guam in the private sector than in the government sector. Without the private healthcare infrastructure, the quality of healthcare will deteriorate as the government of Guam will not be able to replace it. Even the military, we talk about the military built up many, many times, the economy, tourists, even the military, think about it. You have to think twice before they send their active duty families to Guam due to the lack of access to care. Before I came here with the Navy, I go through a physical and they go through details whether or not I'm able to come to Guam to practice at the U.S. Naval Hospital. And the reason why, one of the reasons they do that is because they want to make sure the healthcare on Guam is strong enough. And we get referrals from the military all the time to our private sector. So without the private sector being strong, the military is going to think twice before they send in active personnel here. I mentioned this before. If Bill 112 passes, Guam will lose two of the most critical specialists for women and children. One being Dr. Hirata for high-risk maternal fetal medicine, the other, Dr. Tirada, for women's cancer treatment. In fact, I'm right here in Honolulu, and I want to thank you for allowing me to zoom in. I'm here recruiting, and I was able to convince two other surgeons, Dr. Lee and Dr. Carney, both are university GYN cancer specialist surgeons for women. They're scheduled to visit me in our clinic in Guam in January or February of 2023, just three months away. They'll be on Guam. But when, once this Bill Woman 2 was called to session again, or the hearing, immediately I receive notices that, hey, what's going on here? You know, these are liability risks, you know. So you already raised a red flag for Guam that people are thinking twice before they even try to come here. I also submitted testimony from a previous, um, from a previous hearing from a patient. So I'll, I'll leave that alone and you can read up on it on your own time. I'm almost done. Again, be reminded come January, Guam will have lost eight OBGYNs in just a few years. It is a fact, evidence-based research, having repeatedly shown women with no prenatal care will have increased in death and suffer countless morbidities. Bill 112 will destroy Guam's healthcare system. Bill 112 alone will have harmed the most vulnerable patients in Guam. And those patients are the women and children that Bill 112 will be harming. Now, do I have a few more minutes? May I? Please proceed. Yeah. As far as the OBGYN crisis goes, let me just ask the one question. Is that how many OBGYN do we need on Guam? Certainly seven that's leaving, that's not good. We're going to need three times as many OBGYNs here. Because our population right now, OBGYNs, average age is 65 to 68. I'm still in my 50s, and I've been on Guam for 26 years. It's a hard profession. You're on call 24-7. Prenatal care is difficult. As many of my providers have said, high-risk population on Guam is astronomical compared to other islands and states. The aging population of Guam will be joined, gotta be taken seriously. How do you address bad doctors? Of course, you talk about medical liability, bad, you know, bad malpractice cases. Bill 112 is not gonna get rid of bad doctors. And first, I do not believe doctors have the intent to harm patients. I really do not believe they do that intentionally. Second, we have to address the root cause of any provider that may not be competent either through education or perhaps the lack of experience. Third, once the first two are determined, we must strengthen our peer review system. And we have done so over the years. We have, we have disciplined physicians at the hospital. Fourth, we must provide the Guam board with the resources of any provider who may lack the competency to help patients. From there, through rehab and through education will be the first. And then of course, suspension of licensure of repeated incompetence. Bill 112 is not going to get rid of these back doctors, I always know. Most claim of medical liability, if you research it, I believe most of it are under the umbrella of the government of Guam. This is where the provider of medical discrimination is at. A life under the government of Guam is worth less than a life in a private sector as far as medical liability goes. Now, with that being said, I think um, I would wholeheartedly spend my time, work with you, Madam Speaker, and the rest of the legislature to improve health care in Guam. I promise you I would do that. Even at the end of sunsetting on Guam with my career that I spent a quarter of a century at, I would spend my time and help improve the healthcare with you. But Bill 112 is not going to do it. It's going to set us back big time. 
Thank you for your time allowing me to zoom in. And I'd like to re remain on this Zoom and I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions if you have where I can chime in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shea, and sorry for that it's late back there. But yeah, please remain on the Zoom as long as you, you would like. Dr. Edward Blounts. Hi, I'm Dr. Edward Blounce. I'm speaking on behalf of the Guam Medical Society. I believe you should have received written testimony as well from us. Um, a lot of the points I was going to bring up have already been mentioned, so I'm just going to um, quickly speak and recap a few things. First of all, I would like to thank the senators for continuing discussion with this topic and not push forward the previous bill that was um, brought up last year. And I would like to, as again, I, I want to thank everybody for taking time reviewing and making changes. I think a very important thing to mention as well with this hearing is that the um, the add-ons that are mentioned as part of this bill, the Guam Medical Society um, is very much in favor of both of those add-ons, both to prevent frivolous lawsuits and again to amend the scope of practice because a lot of people on Guam do practice outside of their scope. A lot of what we have to say as the medical society is that we really don't think this bill is fully finished cooking and we don't and we think something this important needs the time to go into it to really have finishing the discussion. Um, a lot of the wording in this bill is very unclear. And like I said, there are certain amendments that we think are important that are not fully included as of yet. Really, if you look back to the history of Guam's malpractice situation, there have been several bills and, sev and pretty much every one has been replaced as of this point. And what that tells me is that this is a very important issue, but we really need to get it right. We don't want to sit down here, get something pushed forth, and then two, three, four years later, come back to the drawing board. So I want to just point out from a medical society standpoint is that we want to really, and the doctors do want to discuss this, this isn't so, um, a lot of these hearings, everything, we're notified after the fact, after the legislation, after the legislature has made a decision, and then we're asked if we're in for or against this legislation. So what I want to say is we are definitely willing to sit around the table. We're willing to help guide the process, come up with something fair, but we want to point out that this is something that is very important and really it has to be done right. And, you know, we need to, we need to give it its time. We need to work everything out and we need to make sure that when we do finish this, that it's as fair as possible for all parties, for the doctors as well as members of the community. So the medical society, I just want to point out, we definitely want to, we appreciate that changes have been made. We think there are more changes that should be made, and we think it's very important that the legislation gets this right. And in that regard, we don't think it's fully cooked yet. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Blounts. Dr. Wen. Uh, 
Hi, good evening. <laughs> I make it short. Um, um, you know, the, I've been practicing here since uh, 1995. That's quite a long time. And I would think the current arbitration law, the, the physician that draft that um, on the idea that will protect the physician. I think that both Dr. Statler and Dr. Crisper has draft that, that they see that there's a shortage of physician in Guam and the way to improve the healthcare system of our island. That's what the arbitration law is there for. Um, so I think that if, if uh, people keep saying that I protect the physician, um, I never see that way in my practice. Um, we understand that there's a flaw in the arbitration law, is that the people that tend to protect which is the indigenous population cannot afford it. And we all recognize that. And again, just like Dr. Shane once say, we are willing to sit down and talk to the senator and come up with a way to fund that. And we, I thought that we did in the past legislature that we come up with proposed bill that I would ask you to really look at it to see if is that feasible to change it so that way the people that you try to protect, especially the indigenous population, can afford the fund to go through the arbitration. So I would ask you to relook at that proposed bill that we work on the last few years and sit down with us and work on this issue um, as a final stage and not keep coming back on this. You know, when this uh, hearing come, um, were announced, um, I don't know about the rest of the practice, but I'm very sure they are the same boat that we are, is that our patients are booked out two or three months ahead of time, and we had to cancel quite a few patients in order to attend this. It's very important because this is for the healthcare of our island. And I can see that if Bill 112 would pass, that we will spend a lot more time in front of the judge than see the patient. And at this point, like everyone say, we are in a severe shortage of primary care specialists, and we cannot afford to sit there in front of the judge to try to you know, point out as a frivolous complaint rather than a valid complaint. And that's what the arbitration law is, is there for, to make sure that we spend our time seeing the patient and take care of the patient. Regarding Bill 112, I tell you, uh, you know, FHP, Rose, and uh, SDA was mentioned, and, and Dr. Vinnie Duenas, is that it's really going to create a severe problem with access to care. And I would agree with Vini, Dr. Duenas, is that we will curtail on day one all the high-risk patients. We cannot. And guess what all the high-risk patients are? The people you try to protect, the indigenous population. And that's the Medicaid and self-pay patient. Those are very complex patients because many reasons they don't have you know, the regular access to care to take care of their chronic care management. So when they come in to see you, uh, they are a walking time bomb that you have to decipher and take the risk of seeing them. I'm not worried about people like you, people who can afford health insurance. You have the ability to see patients, to, to see the provider on a routine basis. But the poor people that cannot have, by many ways, access to care, we cannot no longer see them. Too much high risk for us. You know, we rather spend time, see a certain group of patients that will see you every two to three months 
to make sure that the chronic care management are done correctly, rather than walk into a list of problems that we have no idea. So, yes, the access of care right now is very bad for the indigent population. It's going to get much, much worse. You know, we, the primary care physician here on the island, I tell you, my brother and sister own physician on the, on, in the state, they don't see the complexity of the patient we see here. I cannot afford to refer my patient now to specialists. There's none. You know, you want to see a pulmonologist? Three to four months. You want to see endocrinologist? Four to six months. So I cannot afford to let my patient ride for four to six months. So yes, the primary care physician continue to provide the care just because that's what we're here for. But if this, MM, this MMA get overrided by this Bill 112, I tell you, the, the people who can afford it can go off island, but the majority of my patients at this point cannot go off island. Who's care for them? Nobody. And that's on day one, just like Dr. Nair say, we have to do that to protect our service and protect what we can to do for the people that we serve. So I just ask you, you know, work with us. We know there's a problem in the access to care for the fund. And we propose something to fix that. But, you know, um, again, this 112, uh, I don't think we can recruit any more physician on the island. Uh, the pediatrician are uh, retired, they get getting older. The OB, at this point, we're in severe shortage. Uh, the endocrinologist, we're gonna come down with one on the whole island in the next you know, two years or so, uh, including other specialists. So um, what we try to do is not to protect ourselves with the arbitration uh, protect the healthcare system in Guam and the people in Guam. Remember, we physicians, we are also patient. You know, we lost one or two physicians that live off the island because they understand that they have no care here in the island. So we are also trying to protect our health. So please, you know, work with us, Senator, and you know, it's, um, we didn't say that we know the best, but we were willing to work with you because we understand that it should be equal for everybody, poor or rich. We should be able to do things to go forward. Again, you know, um, I totally oppose uh, the, the 112, and again, we need to sit down at a round table with before and try to work this issue out to help the people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wen. Dr. Berg. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sorry, my throat's a little dry. I saved just a little bit. Okay, um, I will do my best. First of all, thank you so much for giving us a little extra time, but I'll, I'll respect that and try and go as quickly as I can. I think you and I often don't agree on things, but um, I know that you're, and I hope that you trust that my intent is always to try and do what we think is best to improve whether, whether uh, healthcare, whether it's in the regulatory field or legislative field. I don't think anyone's accused you of trying to do something that, that you knew was going to cause harm, and I hope you have, a, I don't think you've ever accused me of that either. We just disagree sometimes. But here I think we agree on a lot. And we even agree right from the premise, which is, as you've heard, we all, every one of us, whether it's members of the legislature or in those in the healthcare community, that the indigent, the poor people of Guam who can't afford access to MMA need to have access. None of us disagree with that. And we actually think that's the problem. I could, if I could, I'd underline that and bold it. That's the problem and we want and I think we've tried, but that's okay. We're forward-looking. We're here.
to help fix the problem. And let me talk about a couple other things that I think we agree on, because I think mostly we agree on more things here than we disagree. I think we agree that there's a shortage of providers. It's not just us. Health and Human Services says Guam is a health profession shortage area, as has been mentioned a couple times, for every single specialty. That's not a thing to be proud of, but we're one of the few uh, regions that is every single specialty is short. We know we're short of OBs. I think I, it's important to know that we, I think you just mentioned, I thought I'll add that, we're patients and our families are here too. I had to take my son off for subspecialty pediatric uh, surgery. He couldn't get it here. And I'm lucky, and I fully realize that. And I had the luxury of time with my, uh, one of my children. I'm not going to say which one, but I had, four, I had four kids, and one of them I had to take them off. It wasn't urgent, but it was kind of urgent. But I was lucky enough that I had time to do that. So we know that others are not so lucky in that regard. And as much as we want, and I know you do too, to make them to have affordable, that is the, the indigent, have affordable access to the MMA, we want them to have access to affordable care. If they can't leave island, we are working, we're doing our best. I'm so happy that we now at least have remote access to a rheumatologist. It it's, can be a devastating disease, Ru, uh, rheumatic uh, diseases, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis can be devastating through the incredibly, uh, uh, Dr. Thorpe has brought someone in. I, I, when I saw her application, I called him and said how excited I was that we had someone of her caliber, Dr. Shapiro, who could serve our people. And he said, careful, mostly by telly, but fortunately, that's especially that can work pretty well with telly. Anyway, I've had to do it. I personally had to go off. I wasn't not sure I was gonna mention that. I personally had to go off for surgery that was not available. We didn't have the specialty care. Thus, my scratchy voice, by the way, forever. Uh, Chris Perez, Dr. Uh, Shea had mentioned, I like to think of him as a good friend, a colleague, and someone who also asked me to stay. I bet you he asked Dr. Wynn too, and said, let's make this uh, a great place to practice medicine so we can get people to come here. I think we can agree, because I haven't heard you disagree on this, that the MMA has been part of making this a better place to practice, which makes it, it's what Chris used to, I'm gonna misquote him, but he say a rising tide carries all ships, something like that. I'm sorry, I can't get the exact quote, but he was so right that when we made it a better environment for all of us, we attracted more people and better people to come out here. Some specialists require other specialists. If they're not there, they can't practice. So we've been pretty good, and I think MMA has been doing that, has helped us do that. It's not everything, but it's been part of it. And, but we're not there yet, we're still short. HHS says it and we say it. The VA has a tough time and they've got basically unlimited funds. They can do it. So what is the impact? Well, it's again, not us. I got an email yesterday, the same as we got last time from my medical practice character, Dave Silva, you may know him, he's gonna submit written testimony, who said, I am obligated to tell you that if the mandatory arbitration provision is removed, your malpractice carrier will not be renewing policies for anybody on Guam. He also told me that he was recently asked to get a malpractice quote for an OBGYN doctor exploring coming to practice and private practice on Guam, and no one in the US market or in his international market are willing to even offer a quote under the current circumstances. So I think, I'm Could sorry, you man. clarify whose testimony that I'm is? I'm sorry, that was an email from Dave Silva. The, Dave Silva is, um, uh, uh, handles our malpractice insurance um, and also GRMC as well. So I apologize, ma'am. Uh, but he's, he had assured me he's going to submit written testimony as well. He, he's off island. I believe he testified last time. Okay. Um, so he's told us we're all going to be a, in trouble. We may not have any malpractice insurance. That's a really big deal, and I think you would agree with that. Um, so what would be the biggest effect right now? Well, he's already said we just may have, I'm not going to misquote, we may not have an OB if she can't get malpractice insurance here. Prenatal care is the first thing that's going to be lost. I'm not going to try not to repeat, but there is what we call an inverse curve with prenatal care access and outcomes at birth, meaning the more you have prenatal care access, the lower the birth-related uh, um, morbidity and mortality, meaning illnesses that, and, and deaths that occur in the prenatal period. So the moms-to-be are going to be the first impacted, especially the indigent, 
The unborn, whom I think we're all talking about protection of the unborn, is a hot topic. Those senators who are saying, I want to protect the lives of the unborn, need to realize this bill does quite the opposite. It puts their lives in danger because the, the, the more difficult it is to get access to prenatal care, the more difficult it is to correct things that are preventable at birth. So kids are born more prematurely who don't have access to prenatal care. I wish Dr. Shea could comment on that. But um, if you don't have access, they're born more prematurely, they have more related problems at the time of birth. There's a some three, four times increased risk of cerebral palsy if you don't have access to prenatal care. That costs society upwards of $2 million per child born with cerebral palsy. So any savings we would have as a society, just got to have a couple of those a year increase, and that causes, and the devastating effects on families is profound. And it will happen. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and when after we don't have more prenatal care. It's, it's not, we can't do anything about it. It's not us not offering care. It just won't be there. So the complications that are preventable are going to occur. The ripple effect of this bill is, I think, also profound. And that word profound was, by, for one, by the judiciary uh, that uh, uh, Chief Justice Carbolito said it would have immediate and profound effect on the judiciary's operations. Now, granted, that's the old bill, but I think it's not changed enough to, we could ask him. Um, and also said that the complex matters requiring specialized training for which and education for which the judiciary has neither the funding nor the internal expertise to accomplish. So it's not just us saying it, and it's us saying we don't believe that they have it, and the judiciary is saying we don't have the expertise. He's saying you'd need a year plus hiring of additional magistrates plus uh, additional funding. And what that brings up in my mind is saying to push the pause button, because there's an old saying that I. Sometimes when things get really complicated, I try to remember a person much smarter than me who wrote a book, again, I'm not the best with quotes, but something like everything I learned, everything I need to know in life I learned in kindergarten. And I promise you I'm not insulting you. I'm saying this for all of us, that this is a really complex issue. So I'm not saying that um, to insult you. What I'm saying is, it, 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 part of that is what, like I've read, I have four kids who've all been raised in Guam, and I read them all a book called uh, if you give a mouse a cookie, where a mouse comes in and a mouse is hungry, the thing to do is what we always do, push the mouse out of the house. If you give the mouse a cookie, he'll want a glass of milk. If he wants a glass of milk, you got to get a glass. If the glass is up high, you got to get a ladder. If you need to get a ladder, you got to get a key. Your dad keeps the keys, they're in the garage, how do you get them? And it goes on and on and on about making the wrong decision to begin with, with the problem. The problem is the mouse is in the house, push the mouse out of the house. The problem is, the problem, and this is also according to Judge McLonia, is the lack of affordability for the indigent to get access to what is otherwise a really good process, the mandatory arbitration, which allows for two doctors and a judge, all of which are agreed upon, to help settle things without going to court. We all agree that that's the best choice. We'd like to keep that there, but fix that problem that we all recognize, and we can. I'm not going to propose the solution today, but I know we can arrive at it, right? We, we, we always arrive at solutions, and we are a community that we want to work together. And Dr. Robinson has said that uh, and emphasized that, that the MMA is part of what's made this a better place to practice medicine, part of what's made it a better place for you to raise your family and to have your neighbors because we have better access to care. We need to step back and remember that. Working together, we will arrive at solutions. We don't want to oppose you. We want to address that solution. And I mean that genuinely, that there's not one person sitting here who doesn't want to address that problem. We do. So let's fix the problem rather than getting rid of something that doesn't need to be gotten rid of. Thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Wen. I mean, sorry, Dr. Berg. Dr. Weir. All right, we have um, three more people to testify. Are we able to fit them here? I see two chairs. Would we be able to make space for the additional one or, or just move over a little? Stand up. Put them one in. Hi. Please stay if you can, and we'll just fit them in if that's possible. Or please stay. If, if you, no, I don't want you to leave, so yeah. If we could put one more chair right there, that'd be, that would be great.
All right, so that's one, two, three. Okay, all right. Dr. Uh, let's just bring them in so we don't interrupt Dr. Weir. Because we don't control them. That's controlled by someone else. Doctor? Is this everyone? So there were only two additional? One, two, three. Okay, great. Dr. Lazon, thank you. All right, Dr. Weir, please proceed. My name is William Weir. Uh, I'm a family physician. Um, I, in this group here, I've probably been on Guam longer than anyone else um, in active practice. <clears throat> I came to Guam in 1989 uh, with FHP. As a family physician, uh, I'm I consider myself somewhat of a dinosaur uh, in that I have always provided full-spectrum um, family medicine um, from before people were born until uh, they died. Um, while on Guam, I have uh, done considerable OB. Um, when I worked at FHP, um, I looked at our population there, and um, FHP is not a typical population for the people of Guam, um, because when you go to FHP, you have health insurance, and you're able to afford health insurance. Um, ROB population was close to 90% high risk. Um, now, some of these risks were, you know, there's risk and then there's risks. Um, but if you look, use, use the parameters, um, it, it, it was unbelievable to me. Um, the whole population of Guam is high risk uh, in that. The majority of people in Guam uh, are Asian Pacific. Um, these people have a very high risk of diabetes, which carries over into almost every realm of medicine, uh, including OB. Um, and so we have problems here just because of the population we work with. With that as background, um, I would like to disagree with um, Judge Mangonia's assessment of what the problem with malpractice is on Guam. Uh, and this, you know, may be, I, I, I hope I'm not, not uh, um, insulting you because I know you are an attorney, but I feel that the main problem we have with malpractice on Guam is a lack of competent attorneys. Um, whether patients have money or not really makes, from my perspective, very little difference when it comes to malpractice. Um, and, and you know that sounds like a shocking statement, but um, I've had malpractice insurance throughout my entire career, um, and when I paid for it, um, 
the limits on the policies that I had were a million, three million dollars. If you look at the kinds of judgments that come down in malpractice cases, um, these are not inconsequential dollar amounts by and large. If you really have a case, you're talking about a lot of money. As the system is set up now, um, the problem is, is that our attorneys on Guam are not willing to put any of their skin in the game. Um, and this bill, as is now written, um, perpetuates that and even makes it worse. Uh, you know, I, I've told people I look at this bill as a welfare bill for, for attorneys. Um, having, you know, I, I'm particularly uh, upset with the last section of this bill when it comes to frivolous when it comes to uh, frivolous lawsuits because it doesn't specify um, any real penalty and we're dealing here according to the beginning of this bill with people who don't have any money to begin with so putting penalties, you know, th these penalties are, are, are non-existent. Uh, and I feel those penalties need to be placed on the attorneys of the people who take these cases. Um, I, my personal feeling is that a, an attorney who brings a frivolous lawsuit um, should have a penalty of perhaps five hundred thousand um, dollars because you know they there there needs to be uh, adequate you know, just like there's malpractice in medicine um, there's malpractice in in the legal system as well. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I, I just, as an aside, um, the whole business of malpractice insurance is a very expensive business. When I came, there are two kinds of malpractice insurance. Uh, when I first started, uh, there was what was called occurrence policies, um, which meant that you were covered for anything that happened while you practiced. Um, but about 40 years ago, the, the standard um, switched to what's called claims made. And that only covers, you pay the premium for the year that you're in practice, and then you pay what's called a tail to cover any, um, any um, cases that might, might come later on. I've never had a malpractice case. Um, and when I came to Guam, I wrote the biggest check I'd ever written in my life for tail insurance for one year of coverage because prior to that I'd had occurrence coverage. And that check was for about 40% of my yearly income for that year. Um, so we're talking, we're talking real money. Um, and I think you need to also understand that physicians, you know, when I went to medical school, it was a, 
afford, affordable. Um, doctors that come out now have on the average of $200,000 of debt. You know, there's, there's a lot of, of anxiety that's associated with that. Um, and malpractice um, is a very um, high anxiety situation for physicians. Um, I, I can't support this bill as it's written. Uh, and um, I think you've, you've heard almost unanimously here that no physician is willing to support this bill. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Weir. Pam Sullivan. Good evening, Ms. Madam Speaker and Senators. Thank you for this opportunity to express my concerns and opinions. My name is Pramila Sullivan. I'm here to speak solely for I, me, and myself. I restress that I'm speaking of and for my own concerns. Okay. I'm a resident of Guam for more than 34 years, and I'm 79 years old. I strongly oppose the bill 112-36. My concern is this bill hinders availability of specialties and subspecialties when needed. I don't want to repeat the past that I had to go through. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. Dr. Gladys Lissonga. Good evening, honorable speaker and senators of the Guam legislature. Thank you for allowing me to speak once again in opposition to the revised bill 112-36. My name is Dr. Gladys Linsangen. I'm a board certified pediatrician and has an active pediatric practice for the past 19 years, serving a diverse population that includes Medicaid and indigent patients. The pediatricians have been very vocal in our stand against Bill 112 and its revision because we know this bill will make things worse for most of our patients, especially the poor and the very sick. We have highlighted the lack of subspecialties in our field and how we have to beg our adult on-island physicians and off-island subspecialists in the different fields of pediatrics to help us take care of these patients. Passing this bill will take away that lifeline that most of our very sick and indigent patients need. Knowing this concern given to you by the specialists in the field of the care of newborn, infants, children, and adolescents, did anyone reach out to the pediatrics department at Guam Memorial Hospital, the only hospital that provides inpatient pediatric care, and inquired about the state of the pediatric care in the island? Did you talk to any private pediatricians to get a sense of what we were talking about? I was a recent past chairman of the pediatric department and is aware of the aggressive recruitment process being carried out to try to fill out the much needed lack of subspecialty in neonatology and pediatric intensive care and the recruitment for new pediatricians to, to man the, pedi the, hospital, the pediatric department at the hospital. But one and a half years later, we still do not have a neonatologist and a pediatric intensivist on our island. We are trying to recruit pediatricians who are willing to, to take care of hospital patients so we can continue to adapt our island to the 20th century of care that is efficient and up to date. Your revised bill will continue to make things worse for the recruitment and retainment of physicians. This legislature should focus on the dire problem our health care faces on island and help to try to find a solution. 
Do you really believe that this bill will be a solution to the sad state of healthcare and Guam in the field of pediatrics and other specialties? Do you think that this bill will enhance our recruitment and retainment of physicians on island and improve the daily health care needs of your constituents? Will you let your legacy be the sponsoring of this bill that will put Guam's health care backwards instead of forward like the rest of the world? I have a nephew born and raised here who is currently doing residency interviews for family practice and his girlfriend for pediatrics. And I'm hoping that I can convince them to come to Guam and help the community and take over my practice. I have never encouraged him to go to medicine because I know it is a difficult path. But still, he chose it anyway and he persevered. If this bill passes, I will not have the heart to encourage him to come back knowing the kind of practice climate he will be exposed to. As a family member, this is something I do not want him to get exposed to, especially at the start of his young career that he has worked so hard for. I strongly believe in justice and equality. Everyone is entitled to it. But it has to be blind, and it cannot be just one-sided. This bill makes it easier for everyone to make false claims. What recourse do physicians have after we have been maligned and made front-page cartoon in the newspapers and social media? We have families, too, that can feel the pain and feel aggrieved over false claims and innuendos, and a livelihood that, whether you accept or not, will definitely affect, be affected by such false claims. What recourse do you have for us? Lastly, I would like to challenge you to be a good senator for everyone you serve, not just for those who voted for you or agreed with what you fight for. You have to work hard for everyone you serve and make sure you make decisions based on their best interest, not just for now, but for their future as well. Your revised Bill 112 will never serve their best interest, not now, not in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Lasagna. Dr. Larry Florencio Lasagna. Good evening, uh, Speaker and Senators. You know, this uh, hearing has gone through many um, uh, sessions. But I've stayed away from the discussion because um, I wanted to see what is really the pulse of the, of the senators. Unfortunately, tonight, I think I need to speak out on, on the experience of my career and the current state of healthcare issues on Guam that would be a challenge to good patient care if this bill is passed. Before the Malpractice, Medical Malpractice Act, I had three lawsuits, frivolous lawsuits. Okay. One, an attorney came, comes to my office and says, settle this for $25,000 and we're done. Next one is I'm being, I'm being targeted by a patient who had a neurological injury because of the Government Claims Act, they decided to go after me, who was the internist, that admitted a patient who had a cervical spine fracture because I missed the fracture. The radiologist was not caught in a suit or named in, the, in a suit, and the, and the neurosurgeon were not named in the suit. Another one is, of course, everybody knows, on New Year's and on Christmas Eve, I get called by a family who says they're going to sue me for $25 million for missing an a, a, a instrumentation of, uh, that was left in an in, in uh, emergency surgery. That experience no longer exists because of the Medical Malpractice Act. And to have that kind of experience is devastating, you know, in your career. You know, you have to spend the time, you have to go through your mind, what have you really done to, to deserve this in what you want to do for the island. 
Okay, I, I want to provide the best care in this island with the resources I have. And I do that as best I can. But when these things happen, and, and, the, and this I just read through here, there's going to be a screening complaint, right? So that complaint, you know, anybody can bring it. So I'm going to take time away from my practice to deal with that complaint. Even though it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't amount to, I mean, again, before the judge sees the case, there's going to be a, a complaint filed. And we have a, an opportunity to exchange with the, the, the person suing us. Well, I don't want to take my time with that. You know, I mean, I'm going to take my time for every, you know, lawsuit that's filed against me because now there's an opportunity to make money. I mean, again, you know, you, you have people that come from off island that back then there was, there was supposed to be specialized in suing doctors. I remember this guy's name, worked for uh, an attorney down uh, in Nagania, and he's here to basically, uh, uh, his expertise to sue doctors. And he was, he was the, he, he sued me on two cases uh, that I named, that I stated earlier. But, so, if we're going to have that complaint filed without any screening, that's screening of the claim, okay? It's going to take time away from my practice, a busy practice, and there's not many internists on island, and then we're going to have to figure out how to settle it so we can all, go, you know, not have to spend more time. It's like, you know, going to the IRS and, and, you know, being told that you basically, you know, owe so much money, do you want to deal with it or settle it? You know, so it, it ends up basically being probably a settlement, even if it's nothing. But, so, I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of having an opportunity for any patients to go after doctors because they're th they think they're wrong. And, you know, as, as I hear the discussion before with regards to this need for the, uh, amend, uh, you know, to change the Medical Malpractice Act, you know, I, I, I'm sorry if I offend the senators here that say that basically they've heard cases of, of medical negligence. Well, who are you to judge to say that that was a medical negligence? Okay, so that's already acting on a, on, in bad faith, in my opinion, to say that we have committed medical negligence and the patients didn't have a chance to go after, you know, what they've been rightfully wrong. Okay? I mean, let, let's, let's give, I mean, let's even this playing field and start from the beginning without any bias as to that, that the people of Guam have been getting bad care. The people of Guam have been getting great care with the resources that we had. If we really don't provide those good care, a lot more things can happen. I mean, why do I need to review a, a, an exam in the Philippines and tell somebody who's, you know, who I saved his heart that, hey, they missed a heart problem over there? You already had an exam. Okay? I can just practice like that. Or somebody that is dying right now of, of prostate cancer who cannot be seen by an oncologist until he gets a biopsy, when it's obvious, obviously a prostate cancer, very aggressive, and he probably is not going to do well, in one year, as stage four, in one year after me following his prostate PSA level. And he has to run to Cedar so he can get treatment immediately. Because the waiting time is three months, and the, and the treatment time is three months. Why do I have to deal with that? And uh, I would, as you said, go see Dr. Ambrali or doc, go see Dr. Friedman. You wait three months. But I care. But I'm going to be part of the problem if there's an, uh, I'm part of the person name in any lawsuit, if there's any issues regarding to, you know, an adverse outcome. And then I have to defend myself as to what my role is, just like the person who had a neck injury, just because I admitted the patient for pain, I'm being named in the lawsuit because I missed a neck problem. So 
you can say that I didn't timely refer the patient to the oncologist. I should have re re uh, given all the, uh, the, 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 um, op the uh, explained all the options for the patient, whether to go off island immediately, stay here, and, and you know, whatever. You know, we could all leave it alone. But we go out of our way to really try to make the best of the situation. And Dr. Lisang is, is correct. The healthcare situation in Guam is bad. There's two oncologists for this island. I mean, I, I don't know if there's gonna be three, okay? But there's two oncologists on this island. People are going off island for cancer care. Okay, th th that's less than what we had before. Okay, so for the people that are alive and have medical illness, we're struggling with retaining doctors here. Yet we're, you know, we're arguing about, we're talking about recruiting for OB so that we can have more deliveries. Or well, maybe, I'm sorry, ladies, uh, the females, but you know, and, I mean, that's before life, right? Was versus people that are alive, what do they need? They need more specialty care. But again, that specialty care is going to be a process that I would have to, to carry through and follow through for the patient to make sure the patient gets the appropriate care and not be sent to a, a wrong specialist, a, you know, an inappropriate timeliness of uh, visits and so forth. Okay, so with the crisis on island, I, I, I hope that, that you senators appreciate really the, the, the shortage of, of uh, specialists on island. I mean, cardiology care is not the standard of care in the mainland, okay? You know, they, we don't have chest pain to cardiac cath time, which is the standard, so that we can stop an, a, a heart attack. I was telling somebody who lives in Vegas, you know, here, we let you have a heart attack, and then we make sure you're stable, and then you go off island and get your, you know, heart evaluated, okay? And that's why I told him, I said, that's why I'm pushing for an angiogram now, because I can't wait until you have a heart attack like the, the mainland it, the, it does, because they can just take you to the car, cath lab. Here, if you have a heart attack, you can't go to the cath lab immediately. So I want to find out, even before you're at, 90%, I want to find out at 80% or 70% that you have heart disease and maybe we need to do something earlier than, you, than, than we would normally do. But those are the, the, the exercises that I go through as a non-specialist internal medicine practice, trying to figure out what is the best way to manage the situation of my patient's care on island without the support of specialists. Dr. Berg talked about, you know, the rheumatologist that came here. I made several diagnoses of rheumatoid arthritis, you know, psoriatic arthritis. I put people on toxic medications because there's nobody here. If there's a side effect, you know, I'm going to be responsible for it. But do I let a patient have a deforming, you know, condition if I don't, if I'm not going to be, um, if I'm going to be watching out for you know, the adverse ev event that may happen because of my, of my actions. So, I, you know, I, I know that the recruitment is a challenge today and, and it's not because of the medical malpractice. But I'm very much certain that it's even going to get worse if this law is passed the way it is because, again, from a standpoint of a practicing physician in internal medicine, without the specialty backup, I am going to be not uh, you know, doing the practice that I've done for the last um, 33 years in Guam. I've been here for 33 years in Guam now, and I know the healthcare environment here, um, you know, but I'm not gonna be doing the same thing, which is sad. You know, f you know from, a med from a financial standpoint, Senator, uh, senators, you know, I was evaluating my practice, you know, and after 30 years of practice, you know, I get a lot of sick patients with multiple medical problems. I don't make money in the clinic, you know, enough to, to support me. I, I work one month because I was ill from my surgery. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, I made $10,000 a month, okay? 
doing in practice. Doing, it's just staying in practice. I have to do hospital to make extra money. But just staying in practice because of all the things that I have to do to do the referrals and, and, and all the things that I have to do that is beyond the scope of what I really could be doing. So I'm evaluating that. Maybe a patient that is going to get a referral next time, I'll just give you a paper and say, go look for a neuro, neuro, uh, respiratory, uh, I mean, a pulmonologist. I'll, I'll just give you a paper that's, you know, go look for it. Because some clinics do that. But I take my time and call Dr. Burke. And I say, Dr. Burke, I have a patient who has a empyema. What do we do? So we go beyond our scope of practice. But I don't know that I'm going to continue to, to do that and risk you know, being, again, called for frivolous suits just because somebody you know, wants to make $25,000 or, or settle a case before you know, the, the, the screening judge. So anyway, um, you know, that's my concern about this um, effort and attempt to, I see it's actually maybe a done deal because so many sign, people have signed on to the, so many senators have signed on to the bill. But, um, you know, uh, I just want to express my, my thoughts about it and, and my sentiment to what it would mean going forward in my practice with regards to, you know, um, you know how I'm going to be handling patient care as an internist. Uh, uh, I've gone for the last 33 years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lizam. Dr. Karen Song. Um, good evening, honorable senators. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Karen Song. I'm not Dr. Song, but um, pharmacist Karen. Um, I came uh, today because um, I feel like we're I felt like deja vu. I said, wow, the last few sessions, I hope our senators, our leaders, heard what we had to say as healthcare providers. We care. Everyone in this room became um, a healer. That's why we went into the art of healing. We did not get into the art of hurting. And so I truly believe that um, when anyone goes to you know, medical school or any of their practices, they go with the desire to heal people. And so that's a given. Um, so last time we were here at this very room, and you heard all of us saying pretty much the same things we're saying tonight, I was like, yes, they heard us. But then a few days ago when I got this, I was actually shocked. And why? Because... This letter right here says, the goal of this legislation remains the same, to prevent court actions against healthcare providers for liability in situations where the facts do not permit a reasonable judgment of malpractice. I think that's a false statement because this legislation will not reach that goal. Number two, to make fair and impartial the proceeding of such claims that are or reasonably may be well-founded. I believe that by doing this, it's gonna do the opposite. I do believe what um, Judge Manglonia did say is the arbitration law does not explain what to do when an indigent plaintiff is incapable of paying. Let's listen to her. She did not say there's a problem with the MMA process. She said, the indigent, unable to pay. So as numerous people before me already mentioned, it is not about the process, it is not the establishment of the MMA that is the issue at hand. It is the pay, pay, you know, capability of being able to afford. And yes, it is sad that when you go through a medical situation where you lose a loved one or lose a limb, it's so devastating. But it is also devastating as Dr. Lizama said, you know, you go through medical school and all that, and then to be, you know, handed this claim, and I strongly believe that Bill 112 will have a flooding of frivolous claims. I truly do. And I think that the way to solve the issues, and I feel for everyone who's had a loss, you know, loved one, their own body parts, 
I would feel devastated if that were my auntie or my son or my daughter, you know, or my parents. I would never want to ever have anyone go through that. And if, for whatever the reason, there's validity, and someone really screwed up and did that to my loved one, yes, they should be accountable. There should be some sort of reparation for the damage that could never be returned. That arm's not going to come back. That life is not going to come back. Yes. But the process, the process has to be where you cannot have people, just because they feel the doctor did something wrong, you know, um, go through this and, 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 like Dr. Lizama mentioned, you know, have to answer to something that in the end, the judge or whoever, whatever process in the end comes out, finds out, oh my gosh, it's just because they felt wronged. It wasn't about what really did happen. And, and I'm sorry, when you go see a doctor, it, the results aren't always the way you want it to be. My, my daughter just came back from a procedure. It didn't quite turn out exactly the way I wanted it or what, the way she wanted it. But the first thing in my mind was not go, oh, I think my doctor, her doctor screwed up. Let's go sue him. He has money, so yes, he is a target for it because he has money. People don't sue people who don't have money that can't pay. So I truly believe Bill 112 is going to hurt not just providers, but the whole island, the healthcare system. I believe there's a better way. And please, senators, we need to get together, not be presented 18, 16 pages and say, comment on it. As one of the doctors mentioned earlier, they're willing to sit down and really maybe burn the night oil to come up with a solution that will help our people, all of our people, not a matter of the rich doctor or the poor or indigent, but all of our people, our community. They all need us. They need you, they need us. They need all of us. And I truly believe that we can do something um, that can help our community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Song. All right, I think that's the um, end of those who signed up to testify. So if you don't mind, um, I'm going to accept questions from the panel. I have a couple comments I would like to make in response to some of the testimony myself. I'd like to begin just to correct some of the facts. First of all, um, the current process, the arbitrators, consist of three panel members. There's a very certain company that you must go through, three arbitrators. One is an attorney. One is a physician. One is neither a doctor, lawyer, or representative of a healthcare institution or insurance company. There are not two doctors on that arbitration panel. Some of you said that. That's not correct. There's only one doctor on that arbitration panel. And so I admit, yes, a panel of arbitration, an arbitration panel which has one doctor on it is different than the pre-screening panel or the pre-screening judge, right? He's not a doctor necessarily, might be, but he's probably not. But these options are still available under the law. If you like the current arbitration system, you can avail of the current arbitration company. You can have the three panel members. You have to get agreement by the patients. And we have seen doctors do this, insurance companies do this in recent cases. And these were all published in the newspaper. Um, there's an excellent article uh, outlining the history of medical malpractice on Guam, which outlines those cases in, in, as well, where in order to get the patients into this arbitration, the doctors or the company, the insurance company paid for the arbitration. And that's the options. It's like if they can't afford it, you can pay for it. Your insurance companies can pay for it. Or 
If neither of you is willing to pay for it or able to pay for it, we are providing a government-funded, one-person pre-screening panel. And this is with the same intent, to stop the floodgates, not open the floodgates. It's confidential, confidential screening to prevent frivolous claims. We propose to add an additional language on top of the current language that prevents frivolous claims. Somebody wants lawyers to be punished. They will be punished with fines for frivolous claims. And with the language we are proposing, they're going, it's going to be additionally reinforced that every judge in every case, if it goes beyond pre-screening to a trial, is going to have to determine whether that was frivolous or not. So they're not going to escape. They're not going to willingly put themselves up to be sanctioned. No one does that. And I know none of you intend, intends, intended, no one who went into the medical profession, I agree with you, intended to hurt anyone. And not a single senator in here is claiming that. No one has said that that is your intent. There's one problem before us. The arbitration that was passed by Dr. Perez and others who worked on that legislation was intended to be faster and less expensive. But it ends up that it is not. That's the reality. So all good intentions, it was not to prevent poor people from filing claims. It was absolutely not intended to do that. So I don't, I'm not going to stand that we on Guam are going to continue to do that. So I have come to the tables and worked repeatedly with the doctors. We get accused of meeting them with them privately. We've tried all kinds of things. I've tried hearing after hearing. This is the forum and I am accepted testimony and we have made amendments to the bill and some of your testimony makes it sound, I have to be frank, that maybe we don't understand the bill or the, or the compromises that have been made. Some of the testimony is very specific and I very much appreciate that, Dr. Blounts, Ms. Greeno, very specific about the language, about uh, acknowledging that the compromises that have been made include um, uh, penalties and, and coverage. And I really want to stress this because this bill does not change the current standard of care, meaning what you are practicing now and you think is not malpractice, is it going to be exactly the same if this bill is passed? That standard of care continues. No one is lessening or increasing the standard of care. In fact, what we have proposed is to add on additional coverage. And I just want to read it because I want to make sure everyone can hear that. The current standard of care is not a state site standard. It's this community standard. It's the duty practice or care by a reasonable physician in the same field, meaning your field, not the fields that we don't have that you are trying to cover. It's in your field. If someone in your field practicing medicine in this community with the supplies and equipment and lack of specialists that we have at the time of the alleged malpractice, that's the standard. And my bill, our bill, does not change that standard. So if you are practicing today and it's not malpractice, it's not going to be malpractice tomorrow. In fact, we've proposed to add on that, provided that it shall be an affirmative defense that can be disputed for a physician who in good faith with the informed consent in writing of the patient provided care in another specialty because of the unavailability of a practitioner on island who offers said specialty, when the failure to provide said care would have adverse consequences for the patient. This reiterates 
that we want you to do what you are doing. We want you to go above and beyond. We want to protect you when you do that because of our particular circumstances. We want to protect you when you do that. That's what this is, language is intended to do, and if you have better language suggested, please submit that, because that, this was submitted in previous hearings. A lot of this language was submitted in previous hearings, and that's the intent, is to go even beyond the current standard of care and protect you more for, what, for your going above and beyond. But nothing in this bill opens floodgates. It, it adds additional protections. We are not giving this to someone on the street to determine whether it's frivolous or not. We're giving it to a pre-screening judge who is going to be appointed by the judiciary, the, the chief justice. He's going to be an existing judge or whoever they decide to appoint, and I'm ex I'm, it's a judge. And we might not like judges or lawyers, but unfortunately, that is our legal system. And this is another thing. I did not invent the legal system. I did not invent that courts are the ultimate fact finder and determina determination, they make the determinations, the final determinations of whether malpractice has occurred or not and whether claimants are going to recover. They make that determination now in every, in every um, case. This is uh, constitutionally allowed to claimants and on Guam to prevent that from happening immediately, we have put in mandatory arbitration. This bill proposes to allow mediation, it proposes to allow a pre-screening judge. And, and let me remind you that we also allow juries to make a determination of whether malpractice has occurred. They're not trained at all. So the court's testimony that magistrates are not trained and will need training, we've changed the magistrates, so we've put the judges in. And the judges are making those determinations today in every jurisdiction. I, well, I want, I'd like to finish a couple of things. Yes. We talked about um, the lack of specialists on Guam and how that's, that's a perennial problem and uh, a problem even prior to Bill 112, and um, you know, yes, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a lawmaker. And that's what I'm here to do, is when the courts signal to us that there's a problem with our laws, we're trying to fix it. And we have worked with you, we have seen your diagrams and your spreadsheets and the, the, the bill that you proposed to another senator that has not been introduced, and that actually provides alternative funding supposed to handle, um, to cover the arbitration costs, but it doesn't. It didn't. At least when I looked at one version, it didn't. It doesn't, it's not enough. And so unless you want all the taxpayers to pay for the most expensive process available, I'm proposing that taxpayers pay for one of the least expensive processes available with the same degree of competence and fairness and the same effect of buffering practitioners from frivolous claims. And I apologize that even the word malpractice and the discussion of it really um, causes pain. I'm sorry for that. I, I do not intend that. That's not my intent at all. It's really just to solve one issue, which is there's a class of people on Guam that are currently not able to file claims that they should be entitled to. Not that we have bad doctors. No one said that.
there's a lot of um, discussion about higher liability and the higher liability is not clearly making sense to me with the current standard of care being continued and the additional coverages and the um, additional screening processes available prior to trial. These are the same processes in other jurisdictions and they're not mandatory in those others and we're making them mandatory here. So even if they don't want to go through arbitration, even the pre-screening process is mandatory here and it's not in every jurisdiction that way. Some of you have told us we should concentrate on the problem and reduce the cost of arbitration, and that's exactly what we have done. We've given you, you can do arbitration according to the Guam arbitration law, not according to this old law, but according to our new Guam arbitration law, which allows you to do a cheaper way of arbitration. You can go to any company, cheaper companies, you can use different types of panels. Instead of the three, you can use the one. You can agree. And this is how arbitration for every other profession is done. And I'm offering it to the medical profession as well. That you can use this arbitration panel or arbitration system that works for all other claims around the world. And that, and I've seen Doctors come to these agreements with patients to use these types of arbitration, and so I believe that that is very possible. That's why we've listened to you. We've put in a 45-day period. Um, the Guam Medical Society proposed additional time for that period, and uh, I'm very open to considering additional time on top of the 45 days. That's the kind of testimony that's very helpful for me because we are very much trying to find something practical here. And this is part of that flow chart that was proposed to us by some of the doctors that they wanted to mandate meetings with the patients before it gets any further. And this is additional. This is not required right now in the arbitration process. We are adding this in, further coverage to you, further opportunity to discuss these with the patients, to make settlements, to, to agree on another process if you don't want to go to this pre-screening judge. And I'm open to the time periods and some of the other suggestions that were provided in details. So the difference between the old law and this bill primarily is the types of arbitration that you can use. The panel members, the cost of them, and that in addition, in addition to that, you can have a pre-trial screening by a judge, which does not open floodgates, it holds it confidential, and the bill is very clear that you can agree if you are satisfied with that pre trial determination, you can agree to hold this confidential forever. You can agree that, and, it, and just like arbitration now, those are confidential unless you go to trial. And that's, that's the same as what this bill is going to do with the pre-trial screening. I don't want to really believe that we have our only recruited doctors in the last since 1998 because poor people and middle-income people can't sue them. I don't want to believe that. And I don't want, I mean, that's a testimony, but I'm going to speak only for myself and not for my colleagues when I say this, that credibility you know, we know this affects you. And I'm trying my best to continue to protect you and just do a fair process. But when 
physicians threaten to drop patients on day one, it really um, affects credibility in my book. It's, um, you are currently doing what you do under the current standard of care. That standard of care is going to be the same. The process, the screening, is not going to be any easier. They're still going to have to meet that standard of, that they're going to have to meet their burden of proof. It's just going to change to a court, uh, either an arbitration fee that you agreed on, or a lesser fee. That's it. The sure, the, there's still in every one of those cases going to ensure that the case has merit. Bef they're going to make determinations of that. I've heard a long list of people who we should have consulted. We've consulted all of those. We've invited doctors, all health professionals. We've had testimony, and those are all posted on my website, still available. Insurance companies, testimonies, and patients. And let's not forget the patients. It's, they've been very persistent. They've come out publicly. Some of them have been dropped from their doctors because they came out publicly supporting a bill that would just lessen the cost of arbitration or lessen the cost of screening. It doesn't affect any of the other protections that doctors have on Guam under law, which is the pre-screening, pre-trial processes, which is peer review processes that are confidential. I went through the whole list earlier. There are more. And we, we are trying with other bills to address other issues. This is one issue. There are other bills that address other issues. For example, recruitment of pediatricians at the Guam Memorial Hospital, $5 million. They told us they have enough money to recruit. They just can't recruit. It's not a money issue. We gave them money anyways. They have liability caps, and they still can't recruit at Guam Memorial Hospital. So the arguments are not parallel. So yes, we, I, I just... I just want to put those on the record as well, and I want you to hear that from me directly, that I'm not trying to hurt anyone here. I'm trying to just make the process a little bit fairer as it was intended to be. It was not intended to be draconian. I don't believe that. I think we're better than that. So, um, Senator Taitu, do you have any questions? Yes. Can I have the senators and then, yes, we will. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we've been here for almost four years trying to come to come some kind of resolution, uh, a balance. And every time doctors have come in front of 95% of you all talk about what's in it for you and hardly ever mention the patients, hardly ever mention the 3,500 people who signed a petition to change the medical malpractice mandatory arbitration that's only on this island. No other jurisdiction has this except Guam. It's, it's really disheartening, you know, because you took an oath. I'm not saying all the physicians here um, are in it for whatever, uh, monetary reasons, but they're here to really help people. There are a lot of good doctors here, but there's some are bad. And if you tell a parent who's lost a child to medical malpractice, it doesn't matter how many good doctors there are to them here. They lost a child. Just one loss of a life is enough to ask the question, 3,500 petitioners signed on Bill 112. 
because they want an opportunity to at least, you know, voice the concerns about how it's very unfair. And judges has, has ruled in that, has mentioned that in their comments, how unfair it is. Doctors threatening to leave Guam if um, this bill passes. And I, I always think to myself, well, if they leave Guam, where are they going? Because there's only one place that ha has mandatory arbitration. Everywhere else, Hawaii, for instance. I have a brother-in-law who's an attorney in Hawaii who actually dealt with a, a malpractice suit. And I asked him, how is it over there? I mean, what's the process? That process, it's so lenient. It, it's a panel where the plaintiff and the defendant sits in a room with a panel, and the panel asks a question, a simple question. Do you still want to pursue going to court? Can you guys work it out? And if the plaintiffs have no, both of them say no, they go straight to court. That's how simple it is in Hawaii. This bill has provided, you know, um, parts in it to protect both sides, on the physician side as well as the patient side. It's a balance that we've been trying to put together for over three years. And they were talking about um, earlier about OBGYNs and how um, it's, we're, we're losing a lot of these doctors and it's ironic because I read recently that the exodus of a lot of physicians are based on, you know, our aging population, actually. 55% of all nurses, registered nurses, are over the age of 50 years old. 52% of active physicians workforce in the workforce is 55 or older and en route to retirement. I mean, I... We recently had a bill that we were talking about our aging population. By the year 2034, there'll be more individuals over the age of 65 than there are children in the U.S. as well as Japan. So we're dealing with an aging population. We need to bring trust back to our community with our doctors on island. Our people need trust. But when you get comments from doctors saying, if this bill should pass, we're not going to treat any poor people. What does that tell you? What does that tell our community? 80% of our community in Guam is said to live in poverty. The amendments that the speaker made as I was listening to your testimonies, I don't think anybody has read her comments with how we're going to make some amendments to the current bill, if you had a chance to look at that on the changes. It should be in front of each and every one of you, her comments on how the changes are going to be made into the bill. I know the speaker doesn't want to, and I speak for myself, as I asked about medical caps and some of the jurisdictions that have them. There are 18 jurisdictions that do not have, 18. Now, when I say jurisdiction, I'm talking about US, ter US territories as well as United States, all the states. There are 18 jurisdictions that do not have medical liability cap. There are nine jurisdictions with one million or more medical liability cap. And there are 25 jurisdictions with less than one million liability cap. It was brought up earlier this afternoon. Why is it that government of Guam doctors are, are, can avail themselves of this cap or they're, and, and yet the private sector is not? I consider it as a consideration because if you look at some states, like California, 
where they have a 250,000 non-economical damage cap. Hawaii has 375,000 non-economical damage cap as well. This could be another option. I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't stop the talks either. We should continue these talks, absolutely. But it's so disheartening when I hear about doctors not willing to see patients. Or what was yesterday? I had a constituent call me up and tell me that she went to her doctor the other day and her doctor started talking to her about Bill 112 and how it's a bad bill. She didn't know what was going on. All she wanted to do was get her care and then go. But he was using that as a political opportunity instead of taking care of the patient. And then you have to ask yourself, what is the priority to that? So I explained to the individual what Bill 112 was all about. And she totally wholeheartedly supports it. Started telling me stories that happened to her family members. I'm not going to mention which hospital, but we've got to find a balance here. Dr. Blanc, you know, I met with you the very first time when we were working on this in my office. A lot of good ideas. Three and a half years later, we are here today, still trying to find, well, you know, COVID made an <laughs> impact, but trying to find a solution. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the balance and of this bill on both sides, both sides, both the physician, the care, health care, caregiver, as well as the patient, our community. Um, I have some other comments. I'm just going to let it go. Um, verse, actually, talking to each one of you, I wrote down, I wanted to ask a question, but I think, uh, I think the speaker said it all, too with some of the comments she made to address that. So, again, I appreciate your time, everyone being here today and making this effort. Thank you so much. Senator Brown, and then we do have some questions and comments. We'll go back to the panel. Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I know a lot has been said today, and certainly in this, this term, sitting in on the um, previous hearings that we've had and roundtable discussions that we've had, hoping that we can, you know, Senator Tidegui, and you mentioned, come to a balance, some sense of consensus of what is workable. I mean, I understand the concern. I mean, you, you spend many years going through your education to get to where you're at, to establish your work, your career, um, and you, we do. You know, so I don't know if it's good or bad about lawyers. We live in a very litigious society these days that anything can be litigated. Um, and it puts everybody in a vulnerable position. And yet at the same time, what recourse do we have for our residents that feel uh, that they may have been harmed? You know, in every profession, you know, you have very good people doing what they do and sometimes you have very bad people or some people make bad judgments and the outcome is not favorable. You know, your car, everything else you can buy, you can replace your body, little different story. I mean, if something happens there that's a mistake, uh, there can be irreparable harm. And what recourse do residents have or do we say, you know, which I would hate to think, is it the view that they're expendable because the overall picture of health care is more important that those that don't have the resources, uh, if they feel that they've been harmed, that they have no recourse? I would hate to think that that's what we're looking at and saying, well, they're expendable. We don't worry about them too bad. I, I would hate to think that, that that's the bottom line message. I do hope we can come to something that's workable. I mean, there are different paths that have been proposed. I know the speaker has outlined uh, in this bill what changes have been made since we had the long, gosh, we had long hearings last year. Uh, but I'm hearing also at the same time, even those amendments are not agreeable to, to many of you that are here. Uh, you may propose the alternate path and say, well, let's fund the arbitration process and there, that's the solution. That's going to help the indigent population if they have a case to move forward. We'll put money in that and we'll fund it. And the one we heard about, they actually expected the people of Guam and the taxpayers to be the one to fund that arbitration. So I don't know where we're at at this point. I don't know if we've made a lot of progress. This issue is not going to go away. May it 
be it you know, those of us that are here now or other members in the next term or the term after, um, the next person that feels they've been harmed or their family's been harmed is going to resurrect this issue and it's not going to go away. And so I'm hoping, is there some way we can come to something that, that will still give comfort to those of you that are in your profession doing what you do, and many of you do very good work every day. But yet I've also had a colleague here because she sponsored this bill and co-sponsored this bill who had a doctor that was providing her care that stopped providing her care because she co-sponsored this bill. What does that tell me? What does that tell the rest of our population? You don't do it our way, well, you suffer the consequences. That, that to me is so unprofessional. I would hate to walk into my doctor's office and my doctor won't have a political conversation with me or say, Joanne, I'm not going to continue to be your doctor because I don't agree with the fact that you've co-sponsored this bill. I would be like, excuse me? I mean, talk about literally holding something over someone's head, especially when the care that they need from you is life-saving. So when you see stuff like that happen, it's just not very professional. It, 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 it just puts that, that sense of distrust. Because if that can happen to my colleague, that could easily happen to me. That could happen to any legislator. And the one thing you, you know, we need to keep in mind, it's not you against us. Us, we're here because the people put us here. They can take us out too, that's, that's their right. They had the opportunity to do that a couple of weeks ago. They can do that next time, assuming we choose to run again. Um, you know, please be mindful of that. We like to think it's just our personalities and, and, and we're, we're fighting this with each other. Um, but, but there is a need, this, this, this underlying concern that's here really, we need to come to some consensus. How do we get there? Otherwise, year after year, it's going to be the same thing. And nobody feels productive, you know, when, there, when there's this much tension and um, concern to the degree that, that for many of you that are either from Guam or have made Guam your home, you know, care for the people here and want to continue to live here and not feel threatened. I know you don't want to feel threatened. I don't think the people of Guam want to feel threatened. Certainly we as legislators for proposing legislation don't want to feel threatened when we're simply trying to come to what's a better solution to make this a better community overall. So I'm hoping we can get there. I don't know how at this point. I mean, I, I had hoped we, had, we would have made more progress than we have in listening to the testimony um, you know, that was provided earlier this afternoon. And even in my absence for a few hours, I was keeping track of the testimony being provided. I was hopeful that we would come to better consensus. I hope that we can. Some of you are the leaders within your group. Um, I hope that we're able to do that because I, I would like to see some resolution so that we can all move forward and, and, and continue to you know, build and make this a better community that we love and care for. It's never been an option for me to leave Guam. I, you know, we can get on a plane every day and go somewhere else. I mean, Guam's home, good, bad, ugly, warts and all. Um, I can live anywhere else. I choose to live here. This is home for me. I know it's home for many of you, and I, I wish we could come to some consensus that you feel protected, that the legal system doesn't become something that uh, abuses you also. Because um, I can understand litigation is not cheap. Even if we did a minor disagreement, it could cost us so much money just to even have, just even get to court, at least of all how many days you're in court. It's very, very, very expensive. I don't know if at the end of the day, maybe the, the lawyers are the only ones that win. Uh, but I hope, I hope we can still come to work to some, something to address this underlying concern. With that, Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Senator Brown. Um, Dr. Lizama and then Dr. Co Dr. Lizama. Uh, again, I started off my testimony by telling you my history regarding lawsuits were before the Medical Malpractice Act. And um, I agree that you know, there should be a better opportunity for people that have been, or they think that they have been wrong and have been shown to, that may, that have shown that they may have had something wrong, that they should have a better way to get, in, to get you know, appropriately addressed. But you know, what I see in this amendment one is that anybody can file a medical malpractice uh, screening, pre-screening claim against, which is what I had. I had four of them, I'm sorry, I mean, if I mentioned, I have four claims against me and I have to deal with it because there was nobody screening that initial complaint. 
So I, I, if, if my colleagues put this in, I, you know, again, maybe that's one of the reasons why I don't participate in this, because we're, we're only in disagreement with maybe our own personal experience, but my experience has been that the screening, I mean, this, uh, the first statement here regarding medical malpractice pre-screening, you know, it gives you 45-day notification, whatever, and I can deal with, and the lawyers and myself will, will deal with the case, and if we come to an agreement, then we don't have to bring it to the screening judge. Well, many of us who have busy time, and maybe, maybe again, like I said, for $25,000, I'm told, you know, I'll drop the case. And, and, and all of this, my involvement was just, one, I admitted a patient who was having pain from a motor vehicle accident, neck fracture. I'm named in the lawsuit. I have to settle that. You know, an instrument left in, the, in, a, in a surgery two years ago. I'm called on midnight, the New Year's Eve. Oh, and it's made public in the, in the media. Oh, you're being sued, Dr. Lizama, for $25 million because you failed to recognize an instrument that was left two years ago. So, you know, and I have to go to my lawyer to that and whatever. So how is this? Fair for me, who, who, who doesn't have the opportunity to, 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 to win this out, I mean, you know, to win it out. So, I, you know, again, if, if this is the, as, as you say, speak, Madam Speaker, that this was the consensus of the Medical Association Society, then I disagree with that because I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm in favor of a screening judge, maybe, you know, but I'm not in favor of a pre-screening, I mean, a pre-screening uh, claim, filing. There's going to be a lot of settlement at low rates, and it just, it just takes time away from your practice. And again, you know, it adds up. Everybody gets involved in the case, can be served a notice. It adds up to money for somebody who, 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 I mean, how are they sanctioned? You said the lawyers may be sanctioned. In the pre-screening stage, they're not. Right? So I don't know how to, I mean, again, I'll, I'll go before pre-screening, I mean, a screening judge, but I'm not going to be dealing with lawsuits uh, because somebody decides to file a, 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 a pre-screening um, claim. I'm not dropping practice of uh, taking care of patients, but my, what I'm saying is that the things that I do that may not be in my you know, area of practice or scope of practice because there's no other specialty, I may have to back off from that because if there is a sense of potential harm, it's easier now to, do, to file a pre-screening claim. I hope, uh, you know, again, that was the, the, the bad times of my life. You know, four claims in one year because I was associated with uh, an insurance company at the doctor's clinic. And then, any, any, you know, once you got a malpractice claim, they'll, they'll come after you. So that's my experience, and I, you know, I don't want to revisit that, and I won't because, I, you know, I, it's just tough. It, it was bad times in my life. I, I understand. Yeah. So the intention of the bill is, um, let me compare it to the current process. So the current process is if someone wants to file a claim against you, they're going to have to serve you with a demand for arbitration. You go directly to arbitration and it's mandatory. So you have to, you can't stay at work. I mean, you're going to have to do that. That's the current law. Right. And there is no 45 days notice. It, they give you notice and you have to be prepared to go forward. That process is going to cost you also. But, uh, but that's assuming speakers that, uh, that you know, we, we've done harm. You know? No. This is the process to determine whether you have done harm. The current mandatory arbitration, before you go anywhere, you're going to have to agree to uh, well, the claimants pay the filing fee. This is the, this is the issue. They're paying filing fees up to $10,000 or more. 
and then they're going to pay arbitrators, three arbitrators, $2,500 each per day. So that's, it's just the cost. And so you too will have to pay arbitrators costs and both parties, of course, pay their own attorneys and experts versus a process where we're mandating 45 days notice for you to talk or work it out and Dr. Blount's is suggesting a longer period of time. And giving you the option, instead of arbitration, as you agree with the parties, you, you can agree to arbitration. You can go to the fancy arbitration. You can agree with the patients to do that. Or you can go to a cheaper arbitration. Or you can go to this government-funded pretrial screening, which is just another confidential, not media, no publicity, screening. And, and that's the choice. Pre-screening judge or arbitration of your choice that you have to get the patients to agree to, meaning you might have to pay that, right? And I'm proposing that the people of Guam may be willing to pay the least expensive way to do that. And if we want to go with the most expensive way, then, then the parties will have to pay that. Um, and this is all to prevent medical professionals from going directly to trial or being brought against your will directly to trial. That's, those are the old ways. That's what these special protections are all for, to prevent a formal claim being filed in court, public, and um, you know you go to trial and, and you have no choice again. But, um, but you're right. I'm going to look again about sanctioning if the pre-trial determines it was frivolous. I think that's a good suggestion. I'm going to look whether my language covers sanctions for frivolous in the pre-trial screening process, as opposed to just at the end of the trial. I would appreciate that. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Doctor uh, Mariana Cook. When? Hello. Don't let me forget, Doctor Shea. He's yeah. online also. He's he's reminding us too to tell him. Um, so I wanted to just you. You focused a lot on this standard of care addition that you put in there to try to protect those of us who are currently practicing at a certain standard of care. Now, my question is, who's going to determine what that standard of care is? I work as an obstetrician most of my day because we are limited to now seven on the island. I am seeing women with pre-gestational diabetes, high blood pressure, things that someone in my position in the States would maybe not be considered standard of care. So same as, as, as Dr. Thorpe and, and Dr. Lazama saying they act as a cardiologist, they act as a nephrologist, they act as a pulmonologist. Again, because our patients can't wait the time it takes to go to those specialists. So your language says that we are protected if there's no other specialists in that area on island, but there are those specialists, just not enough of them. And so we have to act either outside of our scope if we were practicing in the States because the time it would take could be detrimental to the patient's health. Now, whatever informed consent this needs to be um, created for me to talk to a woman and say, I'm a family medicine obstetrician, you really should be seen an OBGYN, but there's not enough on island, so I would like to manage your care. Do I have your agreement? Eventually down the road, if something goes wrong, she can always come back and say, I didn't really understand what you were telling me. You were saying that you could provide the care to me. I'm, you know, that wasn't the agreement I, I came up with. That is where it is concerning for those of us in primary care, practicing on an island where there are specialists, just not enough of them. I would also like to say that there have been issues with whether or not we are going to be able to get malpractice insurance 
if this bill is to pass. And that's been presented by insurance companies themselves. And I know in the previous hearings, there were insurance companies that came to the table. I know Takagi and Associates was here and some other people saying they've looked outside of Guam to who would cover the physicians for malpractice and they were not willing to even give quotes or say that they would offer it. So how are the doctors going to be able to uh, to afford if there is a claim and it goes to a judge or it goes to an expert witness from off island who says no that wasn't the standard of care because Dr. Lazama should have sent this patient to a neurosurgeon right away then that's on Dr. Lazama's plate to to pay that 25 million dollars and how is he going to cover it when he's making ten thousand dollars a month if we're going to talk about the money let's talk about the money we have been saying from the get-go we are worried about patient care senator tidegree you said that this is we've been saying everything about us but we're really talking about how this is going to affect our patients how this is going to affect our ability to continue practicing in a environment where it's not safe for us to take care of all these patients. So we don't like to say no. At my clinic at MPG, we have had to turn away uh, patients because we don't have the availability right now to care for them. Not because they're poor, not because we don't like the way they look, not because of this or that. We just can't do it right now. And you add all these other barriers on top of it, it's overwhelming. Physician burnout is high. There's an aging physician population. Most of the people here are probably thinking about retirement and greener pastures. Me, this is going to be my problem. That's what a lot of the other physicians have been saying. You guys who are young, under 40, you got to come out here and fight this fight because we are going to be left with no providers, we're going to have to give everyone a referral, we're going to have to tell everyone to go off island, and honestly, 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 the patients are going to be the ones who suffer. It's not about me. If I cared about me, I would take my family and go where I could make more money to afford malpractice. Guam is my home. Guam is where I want to live. I came home to serve this island. So that's the reality of this and some of the concerns we have with the bill that's been proposed. Thank you, Dr. Cook. So the um, informed consent law already exists on Guam. So that is already um, outlined. Uh, and there was a proposed by one of the doctors who testified in a different hearing that we copy Georgia's law and put additional requirements. But I do believe that it already exists in Guam law. And if you think that that needs to be changed, we can look at that. But I, I did look at it. and. Um, uh, I'm just going to try to. Yes. Well, and then, uh, yeah. So Dr. there is, oh, yeah. I'll send that to you. It already exists. So this is required. And again, this is the current standard of care. So what you are able to do today, you should be able to do tomorrow. And the, the point that you made about uh, the language about of, um, unavailability, unavailability of a practitioner on island. Yeah, that's a good point. I have thought about that, but this was the only language proposed in any of the hearings. If you have any additional language, I'm willing to consider that. Um, you know, when, when do you draw the line? And, you know, so... Of course, I trust your judgment, but should we trust everybody's judgment as to whether that should have been referred or not? Just give me some language as to how we should grade that. And none of us here is going to determine uh, what your, um, how did you describe it? you know, what a reasonable physician in your field is going to be, it's going to be determined in the exact same way that is, it is now going to be determined in arbitration. Exactly the same. Same, you're going to bring in experts to say that or not say that, and they're going to discuss what is your field, and they're going to discuss what is your community, for sure. That's exactly, it's supposed to be exactly the same in both processes, in either process. That, and that's, that's, 
what happens right now in mar arbitration. Senator Taitsuka. Dr. Um, Mariana, um, do you, have you tried to get a medical malpractice insurance? Um, the, the, uh, the owners of my business were very smart and we pay into a captive. So I am in a different situation um, than most of the providers. But we do base it off of uh, the GovGuam caps. So in a real, you know, out of GovGuam case, it might not be enough to cover just one case that could come up. I see. Okay, um, you talked about referrals, uh, and you talked about the concern of uh, patients um, outside the scope of work that you do. Um, it was mentioned earlier about telemedicine. How does that work in the event um, you have a situation where you have a patient, you have the opportunity to use telemedicine to call a specialist in that field? Um, do they... I mean, it's obvious they probably have insurance themselves because you're calling from off island, and most doctors in the state and nurses or any healthcare, they all have insurance, medical malpractice insurance. How does that work, though, with, with you? If um, they tell you one thing and it makes a mistake and you did the wrong thing, I mean, how, that kind of scenario. And telemedicine is yeah. really being big now. I mean, considering where we are in the world, it's, it's difficult to get specialists here because our population doesn't support an individual doctor who has a specialized field. It's very difficult. Um, even in rural America, it's, it's difficult to get specialists in that area. So telemedicine is uh, going to be very instrumental for this island. Yeah. Um, I wish Dr. Thorpe was still here to talk about how he works with the rheumatologist through telemedicine. I don't work with a lot of telemedicine doctors. Um, my, oh, there he is. I called I heard him you. <laughs> um, I have worked with a medical school classmate who helped me with an aortic valve replacement patient who we do not have anyone on island who does that. He was able to do a consult via telemedicine, um, but then I sent her to to that person. So uh, I wasn't managing based on the telemedicine um, recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, the referrals I was talking about is if I have a bad diabetic who's pregnant in the States, she would be seen an endocrinologist. Right. Dr. Alford is overwhelmed as the only endocrinologist on Guam, well, Dr. Rubio, but he's close to retirement soon. Um, but they cannot manage, so we have to. Um, and, and that's the referrals I was talking about. Every time I come up with a nephrology patient, I could send them to the nephrologist. Every time I come up with someone who's not well controlled, that's over my head, I could just say, here's a paper, like Dr. Lazama said, here's a paper, go see your specialist, try to find the time, three months, four months down the road, they'll fit you in. Um, but we work together as a community. I message friends, I say, hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing, can, can you, um, help me manage and they give me recommendations and I work with the patient and I usually tell them I reached out to so and so and are you okay if I continue this process so I have that informed consent going on but I don't have anything written and and formal that's going to maybe be withheld in 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 court um, so that's a process we'll have to figure out if this ever does go forward but well, I think even if it doesn't go forward it's something that should you know I mean I hear that Doctors always maintain a diary whenever they're, um, you know, seeing a patient. Everything is written down verbatim, the time, what, what uh, uh, tests that you offered them, everything. It's like a diary. You know? we, we chart, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, we do. And I always write in there that I consulted with so-and-so and, -so and we talked about it. But I don't know how specific this informed consent process needs to be if mm -hmm. I'm ever brought to trial. Okay. Uh, Dr. Thor, can you give, give us a little insight on how telemedicine works with you when you're, you're getting information from another doctor um, who could actually give you maybe the wrong information for your, for your patient? Um, how does that work as far as uh, uh, who, if there's any kind of medical malpractice in that situation of telemedicine? Thank you, Senator, for the question. I apologize. I stepped out because I'm on call for the hospital. I kept getting calls. I didn't want to uh, disrupt everyone. Um, so in the scenario of rheumatology care, because we have no rheumatologist here on island, 
Um, I've cared for several patients that Dr. Lazama has sent uh, to see Dr. Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro um, was a visiting rheumatologist to our clinic here in the months of July and August. Uh, she's faculty out of University of Texas School of Medicine in Austin, I believe it is, and uh, was in the same residency program um, at Johns Hopkins University, and that's how I came in contact with her. And I said, hey, look, we've got a lot of rheumatology care. Is there any way you'd be able to come out? And so she works with a number of different telemedicine um, uh, companies that provide asynchronous consultations uh, to primary care providers. And so she was here for the uh, four weeks that she saw patients that had a full schedule, but couldn't see approximately 80 patients that had called in for an appointment. And so I um, agreed to continue seeing these patients um, on a sequential basis. And then she, um, as she is licensed here in Guam, and we've kept her uh, license active, um, she re reviews the chart after I see the patient, and then she'll put a consultative note um, in to say, I agree with the information that I've ha um, received and the clinical diagnosis that has been made and the recommended treatment plan, or here's what I would suggest um, as changes to that treatment plan uh, going forward. And then there's a disclaimer at the bottom that it's up to me as a primary care doctor uh, that, to make institute these uh, treatments and um, provide the care um, at my discretion. I have to be the final decision maker for me, for the patient. But be, And coming back to the community standard, I feel comfortable doing this because now I have um, a world-renowned rheumatologist who is commenting on care for patients who are very complex and very, very ill um, and able to provide a helping hand in order to, to seek the to provide a solution for the patient. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, and, up, excuse ahead. me, yeah, please. So, excuse me. I'm going to wait outside sure, sure, because I keep you. getting calls. Thank yeah. You. So, uh, Dr. Shea. Okay. Well, thank you for allowing me the time to comment. A couple of things that I wanted to bring up is I heard that our testimony, no one has talked about patients. I read my testimony again, and my entire testimony is about patients. I have no idea if the senators were listening, but you know, I read my testimony again, but it's all about patients. In fact, I mentioned that patients' lives would not be saved if we didn't have our specialists like maternal fetal medicine on Guam. And the life that we saved, I already testified in previously with patients' testimonies as well. So I want to clarify in record that most of our testimony is about patients. And I concur with Dr. Larry Lazama that Bill 112 is not uh, favorable for Guam, for patients, regardless of what, um, what we hear from the legislature that telling us that this is good, this is, this is great. It's not. And you heard from my colleagues um, speak on that. Now, what I don't understand is this. What I don't understand is how can we tolerate and continue with the current standard of care on Guam? What we have, what we want, what we should advocate for is a continuation of increasing the standard of care for patients on Guam. We shouldn't tell Dr. Lazama or Dr. Cook, who's in family practice, to be practicing obstetrics, high-risk obstetrics, because we should not be accepting that type of standard of care where it's practicing outside of our specialty. Just because you put in a bill that says, hey, we're gonna, you can go ahead and continue to practice the way you're practicing. That's 1970s, that's 1960s. What we wanna do is for the legislature to help us, help us saying that, hey, we want you to increase your standard of care. And how do we do that? We can do that by helping us get the specialists on Guam. You get $5 million, that's great, of course. Money is really not the attraction. I hate to say it, but money is not the attraction. I have Medicaid patients, I have self-pay patients, and I never send them a bill. For my clinic, we've never sent a bill to the patients. We've always said pay when you can. And it's not that I don't want to set patients anymore, it's because I'm overwhelmed. As a doctor who's not from Guam, being there for a quarter of a century, 26 years. I've never imagined myself practicing OBGYN solo, being on call 24 seven, be available to patients. And I'm very open with my patients. I tell them that, hey, this is my recommendation. And if I tell you to go off island, you gotta go off island. If I tell you this is what you gotta do, you gotta, this is what you gotta do. 
That's my honest opinion to a patient. And I believe I'm a good doctor. I'm board certified and make sure I keep up with the updates. I have Dr. Hirata, who is our backup as maternal fetal medicine. Even I, as a fully board certified physician, OBGYN on Guam, your cases on Guam where obstetric is such a high risk field. And Dr. Ware, who I work with when I was in the Navy, I had to drive down to public health on the weekend to see patients in, in Iran, the clinic there, we see tons of high-risk patients. And poor guy sees high-risk patients himself and he's a family practice. And you're, you're saying, continue, it's okay. Continue to practice that type of standard of care. No, that's the wrong mentality. What we wanna do is we, we want to work with you. We want to sit down, work with you to, to help us help you help patients on Guam, help doctors help patients to come to a consensus, not about suing doctors. Oh yeah, there's malpractice. We want to make it easier for a patient to access the court system. What you just mentioned and Dr. Lazama has mentioned, that guy has gone through a lot. When I first opened my practice, I called Larry, Larry, I need an office. He opened his clinic and he accepted me in his office for the first year, second year. After that, you know, we went on our own, but I have to thank Dr. Lazama because he took me in as one of my mentors and helped establish the practice along with Dr. Perez, Dr. Stadler, and the colleagues that's around, around me that said, Tom, we need you to stay. One year, two year, I told Dr. Perez, I'll give you one year in private practice, but I gotta go, I gotta go back to Hawaii where I'm at right now. But you cannot compare Hawaii and Guam. You're comparing apples and oranges. I keep hearing Hawaii is so easy to, to access the system. Hawaii has how many OBGYNs? We have thousands of OBGYNs. Four sort of OB, we have thousands. We have how many gyne oncologists? We have probably six, seven gyne onks on Guam. No, we have six, seven gyne onks in Honolulu that we can pick up the phone and call. We have several maternal fetal medicine specialists where I can just call or refer and see down the street, five minutes away. How many hospitals do we have in Hawaii? I think, believe we have seven hospitals here in Honolulu, Hawaii, Queens being the biggest. The rest is Hawaii Pacific Healthcare, Kapilani, Straub, Polymomi, Kaiser Hospital, Tripler, which is the biggest army medical center here. You can't compare those to Guam. Guam is, it's different. It's not the same. I can tell you that after 26 years of my practice there, and trust me, I've done a lot of charity work on Guam from Drive for Justice for Bone Marrow Drive to providing charity care for, to, to free care in community service. And I still provide free care in my clinic. But it's not that I don't want to continue to take patients or because of Bill 112 that, hey, you sponsoring this bill, I'm not going to take you. That is not the point. The point here is that we want to help you. We want to help patients because ourselves are patients. And we're able to fly off island to see a specialist to see. But if it is a poor class. I heard, I heard someone said, we're talking about a class of patients that don't have access or they've been discriminated against and they don't have access to the arbitration. I, I like to disagree with that statement. And I'll just take one step back. Let's, let's not talk about going to court, suing doctors. Let's talk about providing care for that class of people. What we, if you care about that quote unquote class of people that you're considering indigent who can't afford care, what we should be working towards is a solution to help them get the health care that they need. Not to say, hey, you see this doctor or oh, something went wrong. It's malpractice. Go ahead and sue and go ahead. Because now 112 is saying is saying this. You don't have to mandatory arbitrate anymore. You have a choice. And listen, don't agree with what the doctors are telling you because don't agree with the three, three person panel. You have a choice. Go with the judge because the judge has no medical knowledge. They, they, they don't know anything about obstetrics or gynecology. Yeah, you got to bring an expert. And most of the experts are coming off island. You think coming off island, those specialists in Hawaii is going to understand the standard of care in Guam? Absolutely not. I know that for a fact. I practice in Hawaii and I practice in Guam. The standard of care that I see here and standard of care in Guam is totally different. We have to change that mentality. We've got to increase the standard of care for Guam, not keep it the same. The bill saying that, hey, we're going to add this, add that to keep, the, you can keep practicing. Dr. Cook, go ahead and keep practicing your standard of care. 
No, Dr. Cook is doing her best in taking high risk patients, which shouldn't she she shouldn't be doing. Period. But what you're saying is that you're condoning and say, hey, go ahead and do that. She's doing it because it may not be a choice for her. But that is something that we shouldn't accept as doctors and as legislatures. You shouldn't because Bill 112 is not going to help that. He's not going to help that class of people that you're referencing to. Someone brought up the point about telemedicine. I know telemedicine very well. We were the first to establish that on Guam that we never mentioned it. I contact Hawaii all the time. I'm part of the university group. I'm a part of the faculty. We have direct line on a CAT6 line to Kapiolani, Queens, Polymomy, and Straub. Let me tell you about telemedicine. You cannot deliver a baby through a computer. You cannot reach out to the computer of somebody who is bleeding and stop and clamp the arteries. Those are the, the things that we have to do immediately to stop a patient from bleeding out. Telemedicine is not going to help that, not at all. So that's something you got to realize. Telemedicine is not going to help. The NICU that we have is all procedure oriented. You have 28 weeks neonate. You expect a regular pediatrician to be taking care of a neonate that's 26 six weeks or 28 weeks? No way. We have no neonatologists on Guam. So you know what I tell my high-risk patients? Listen, you may deliver early, under 30 weeks, under 32 weeks. You should go off island. I have triplets. I have a triplet in, in my practice right now. I'm telling her, you got to get off island. Some twins, the Naval Medical Center twins, go off island for delivery. Or they try to refer it to me. I do my best to accept who I can. But we cannot accept the standard of care that we have now. That has got to go away. Now, let me comment real quick on the notion of the, the Mandatory Arbitration Act. The notion that that's unfair is not true. It really isn't true. If the attorneys are telling you, telling you it's not fair, it's not true. Citing the cost of arbitration is, is, is totally untrue. And Dr. Ware put it correctly. I'm so glad he's there because out of all the physicians that's there right now, Dr. Ware is the one of the most, I shouldn't say he's the oldest, he's the eldest, the most wisest physician that I've known since I've arrived on Guam because he was with doctor's clinic. Dr. Perez was there. What he said, Bill 112 is basically a welfare barrel for liability uh, attorney, which is very, very true. Remember now, also the plaintiff in the manager arbitration act, they are not prevented to moving to trial. And what the Supreme Court justice said, one of them said, hey, we're talking about this class of poor population that doesn't have access. That is the class that we should help. They didn't say to change the entire arbitration process. The no way in the justice Supreme Court decision that I've read, my dad has read, my uncle has read, and who are attorneys, this doesn't say that it changed the arbitration process. What they said is that that poor class of people should be helped. Let's help them, not just to have access to the court system. We already gave you a solution to help fund that, but help them get the care that they need so that they don't put the blame on the doctors when there's a bad outcome. The, there's a famous saying that we always been told when we go to medical school. The surgery went perfectly well, but the patient died. That is a famous saying that we always get drilled on as surgeons. It's very true. It is very true. Okay, because we can do everything possible in the best surgical hands. Bad outcome does not mean malpractice. But what you're saying with Bill 112 is you got a bad outcome, Go to one judge who have no medical knowledge. And from there, if they don't agree on a treat person, yeah, you have the option to go to a mandatory arbitration. That's, it's not true. The liability attorney is not going to say, oh, let's just fall back to the mandatory arbitration act. They're going to go to the one judge that says, hey, let's go to that judge, but the judge doesn't have medical background. That's easy. I can convince that judge to, hey, you know, let, let's go, let's go to trial. So it's not the same. You're saying it's the same or it's good. The, the amendment is not the same. Now, like I said before, my dad's attorney, if, they, if somebody comes to him with a medical malpractice case, they say that somebody lost a leg or um, a deformity in the baby that was not detected um, Dr. or a delaying diagnosis of a breast cancer or let's say, you know, the mammogram missed it or something like that. If there's merit in the case, my dad would accept that case and move forward with it. He Dr. would invest Shane. in the case and go yeah. to arbitration. So I think it is important for us to, to, to take a step back and say, hey, if we're going to help that class of people, 
We must help that class of people get the health care that they need. Bill 112 is not going to help that class of people. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Yes, I did. And I was trying to ask yes, you, sir. is your debt practicing on Guam? Because if not, then it's really not the same, is it? Just like we don't want to hold you to the standard of care in Hawaii, here on Guam, we, we can't... Um, what attorneys are able to do in other places and bring uh, lawsuits, like you say, that's, uh, that's why we're here, because they're not able to do that here on Guam. They're not even able to take their clients to arbitration because of the cost. So it's a very different situation. And I'm going to ask well, I, uh, Dr. Well, well I, you, I disagree if, with that point because... Yes, because I know you disagree, care, Dr. Shea. Right, but the standard of care that you're referencing is Dr. the same what I'm talking about, right? You want the best for patients. We want the best for patients, correct? We want to make sure that we improve the standard of care. That's right. We agree on that. Thank you. Yes. So what I'm saying Thank is you. this. What I'm saying, it doesn't matter what jurisdiction that you're in. If a malpractice case has merit, why wouldn't the attorney accept it? It's not because the cost of arbitration. The cost of litigation is always more expensive. We agree to that. In fact, I heard some senators saying the cost of litigation is much more expensive. Now, attorney, so, Dr. Shea, I don't know if you, you're understanding the issue here. It's not about attorneys accepting the cases. It's about patients paying the costs of the most expensive arbitration process versus a less expensive arbitration process versus a very inexpensive pre-screening process. If you don't mind, I'm no, going I'm to ask Dr. Wen no, no, for no. his the comments The patient pays well. nothing. Dr. Shea, no, no, the please. patient pays nothing. The attorney, liability attorney, No, that's always, not correct, always, Dr. Always, Shea. Always, Dr. Shea. That's not correct. That's not the facts. And this is the problem that's happened with the dialogue. When, when we depart from the real facts, then fear spreads through the, the physician community and all kinds of... Threats happen, and I just want to stick oh, no, no, to the no, facts. No, no. If you don't what mind, I'm Dr. Shea, just uh, give me a minute. I'm going to ask Dr. Wen if he has a comment or question. Hi. Um, i just make it real quick, because uh, Dr. Shea, I don't know time. But, um, you know, the standard of care is a um, very gray area. You know, what we have... One of the biggest practices in Guam, uh, about 46,000 patients. We have uh, a lot of physicians. But if you're going to ask the physician in our group, what is the standard of care that you currently practice, I guarantee every one of them is going to be different. And that's what happened when, when, speaker, when we go to court. <laughs> It depends on who standard of care you're going to follow. Standard of care, we, we take care from newborn all the way to you hit the grave. And, and this, what I'm proposing in the bill, does not affect what you have to do when you go to arbitration either. It's exactly the yeah. same. You have the same dilemma, right? It's those people. I understand. Who are not but necessarily from Guam who are making that determination. Yes. And that's, I, that's I the same. But that's, that's the way it is in that's, every That's case. the way where... Uh, one single judge will be decide what the standard of care when you have so many things in the gray area. That's why when we say that we're going to restrict our practice because the standard of care is so gray uh, when this thing uh, come on board. And it's not because we're not professional, trust me. Uh, when we take the risk of our practice, of one lawsuit, just like Dr. Cook was saying, is going to shut down the home practice, and it's going to affect 46,000 patients for one. And I don't think that if we shut down AMC, uh, this whole access to care on this whole island, I don't think no single clinic can absorb the 46,000 patients to go out. Dr. And every Wayne. time that we make a decision, yes, in our practice, yeah, we discharge a few patients just because different reasons. Every time we discharge a patient, 
uh, is a consultation of many physicians to take the risk of our practice regarding keep the patient. So yes, um, I, I, the complexity of the patient here, you cannot believe what the complexity of the patient here. And we are all, I tell you, practice way out of our scope of practice because we can't afford to send the patient anywhere. And yes, the standard of care uh, doesn't matter what everyone say. Uh, it's a very gray area that, yes, we practice now different than when the Bill 112 is there. All right, that's what you're saying, Dr. Wen, and I'm telling you, I hear you, that the standard of care today is a gray area. And so the standard of care tomorrow, because this bill does not change that standard of care, will continue to be a gray area. It will continue to be decided by someone else. It's going to be decided either by the ar three arbitrators in a panel who are not necessarily from Guam. That's the way the law works. That's the way all, all laws work. It's either gonna be decided by a jury. If you don't go there, it's gonna be decided by a judge. We are trying to prevent that and allow it to be decided by uh, either arbitration or a pre-screening judge. And that's going to be up to you if this bill passes. And we're still precluding oh. that from, um, I mean, otherwise, in every other profession and industry, it goes to a jury or it goes to a judge straight. There's no pre-screening, there's no pre-trial arbitration mandated. All right, so, Can Dr. I, uh, Berg, did you have a question? We have to reset, so if you want to talk longer, Dr. Shea and Dr. Berg, we're gonna have to reset the um, audio and um, I guess continue. Yeah, just one more comment that. on the insurance, the malpractice insurance aspect. That's it. Yes, Dr. Berg, please. Please be quick. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. I think there are two things. And I understand your feeling that people are threatening. But I think that, you know, it's not, I think you have to re look at that and um, keep it. I'm asking just keep it, it's, it's, we're trying not to be adversarial here. We really are having, trying, maybe this is the calmest we've had of these discussions, that it's not really a threat. It, the, the physicians feel that they are in an extraordinarily difficult situation, where, as Dr. Wynn put it, is it, do they want to take that risk if they feel that one giant unnecessary lawsuit could take away their ability to take care of everybody else? It's not a threat in the sense that we don't do it for that reason. They're saying if we feel threatened. Dr. Burke, yeah. isn't that the same risk under the current arbitration practice? I, uh, well, yes, here's, here's because the thing. you could be here's, sent to arbitration uh, and they could come up with the same award that you're worried about right now. That's a risk. Well, yeah, and then they could take you to court after that under the current law and they could give you a make a higher award. Well, so here, it's, here's, that here. risk exists. That risk does not come about from this bill. It already exists. Well, I think, and I'm sorry, but we're going to have to reset the panel. Okay. So we're going to have to wait, I guess. So we're going to take a short recess while they reset the audio. How long does it take? A couple minutes?